uh, Detective Cornell had successfully taken down a serial killer who had gotten on the island, uh, sent with security clearances by, given by the NWO, uh, who had been hunting down and killing uh, doppelganger humans, what they call human impersonators, or changelings, as uh, LeRoy has referred to them, and I believe Nathaniel Furneaux also called them that. In the process, uh, Claudia lost a member of her squad, but you all sort of, it was not for nothing, I'll say that. Um, in addition to that, Mikey had, uh, Mikey, Detective De La Cruz and Detective Ornoco dealt with a hostage situation on the Broken Heart Bridge with some of your uh, rival characters. They had managed to get away, uh, but the hostages were secured. And now everything is in place for beginning the escort of Danny to Atlantis. Well, you did have backup. Uh, you remember somebody dealt with the samurai. Some of them. Oh, yeah, that's true. But yes, rest in peace, Thor. Before you begin your escort operation, however, uh, Director Volta of Rivers has requested your presence for a sit down a briefing of events and different facts surrounding some of your cases and the happenings in guam so for those who attend which i assume would be all of you no one in character would have a problem with this maybe yes. you just hate the coffee no no <laughs> Coffee might be bad, but uh, I, I don't think anyone would refuse to attend just because of the coffee being bad. I bet they have some hella, like, crazy coffee up here, though. Because they have to be awake at all times, probably. I need to also make a sheet for Detective Towner. But I'll deal with that some other time. There we go. So, is there anything any of you would need to do before you go to the lighthouse? Because, like, just rushing you there from what you may have been wrapped up in isn't always going to make sense narratively. Um, is there anything Mikey needed to do before, after, after the encounter with the rivals on the bridge? Anything he wanted to do? Uh, no, I can't personally think of anything. I mean, other than just kind of lick our wounds, make sure Enya is okay. Then I guess find the others, make sure they're okay. Right. I picture everyone meeting back up at the station afterward and just like, all right, we need like an emergency meeting at the lighthouse. But turns out we were summoned, so... Yes, right. Uh, the emergency meeting is important um, for members of Rivers. The It seems like the more you're at Rivers, the more you notice that the other people that work there are kind. They're not exactly faceless, but they kind of like are in and out very quickly. 
as in some of them will appear, walk in, take a file, leave, or they're walking on their way to somewhere else and they smell like they've been in the Arctic. They have a weird frosty smell to them, like the air is chill. And some of them are have an even stranger smell, like almost bacon or something being fried. Uh, these types of people usually are wearing um, very technologically advanced looking environmental suits. Uh, and three of them in particular are wearing very neon pink environmental suits as well. Throughout the lighthouse structure, which at once peer, appears to be the, a very utilitarian building and also somehow designed with an aesthetic or purpose, though it is unsure of what that might be. There are stories happening here and there, and you can tell that they are in different genres as well. For every person that is just standing and joking with a friend, uh, there may be one who's just standing off in a corner staring blankly because they've seen something so either horrific or awe-inspiring that it has given them like almost a mandatory pause to re-examine maybe their life or the fundamentals of the universe in which they live. These two types, three types, four types, many different types of genres and atmospheres and vibes are all existing in the lighthouse at once. And it often seems like those who are existent in one may not pay attention to the other as much or they may brush it off. Uh, for your vibe, there is, well, the story of crime, punishment, protection, safety, and dealing with the consequences of the past along with the burden of the future. A very fateful and heavy destiny. But who's to say that the destinies of those that you see within the lighthouse are not as equally heavy? Once you have all fully arrived, Director Volta will personally greet you, as it seems he's been waiting, and introduce you to someone you've already met, which would be this man, Mr. Mr. Jr. In his official capacity, Mr. Mr. Jr. is a... Well, he is the director of the Speedwagon Foundation, but that is close to being incorporated entirely within Rivers. In a very solitary, uh, let's say solitary, like a solemn, that's the word I was looking for, a meeting room. Mr. Mr. Jr., once he has directed you there, will begin to set up various devices, uh, projectors, as well as start to hand out uh, tablets that have the information that he is going to begin discussing. Um, there are also other Rivers agents in the room taking notes. Some of them uh, look like just normal, everyday people. Some of them are dressed like the only way to describe is space age supermodels, but they all seem to be pretty much where they should be. Nobody's very, very out of place, at least. Mr. 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 Jr., once uh, he has handed everything out and made proper introductions with others in the room, we'll turn to your group in Aqua and begin a small presentation, turning off the lights and starting up a projector screen on a wall. He goes to press the button and then waits. Nothing happens. He presses it again. And he looks at Director Volta. Yeah. Can you help me with this, please? Director Volta springs to his feet, walks over, and begins to 
touch a few wires on the projector, which is looks like it's been rigged up from different parts found somewhere. It doesn't exactly look like standardized technology. Mr. Mr. Jr. folds his arms while he's getting that ready. Hello again. I am Mr. Mr. Jr., head of the Mr. Clan and director of the Speedwagon Foundation. You may remember me from our earlier meeting. He adjusts his sunglasses. Currently, I am part of the archival branch of Rivers. The Speedwagon Foundation has a great deal of historical documents and research that are important for, well, investigations into what Rivers is doing. Director Volta uh, is still working on the projector machine and then a small spray of sparks emits from it, causing some people in the crowd to mutter. Yeah, hey, it's been a while. I don't think we met before. Hi, uh, Mikey De La Cruz. I have not met you either. I am Dr. Icebe. It's a pleasure. I am Claudia Cornell. Even if we haven't met before, I've read most of your files, and I was familiar somewhat with the dealings of your police unit. As you know, there have been a lot of happenings in Guam, so it makes sense to know who the players are. Though, you're right, for some of you, this is our first time meeting in person. I have to say I'm neither surprised nor disappointed. It seems your group is exactly what I had imagined. He adjusts his sunglasses again. That mean? Don't read too deeply into it. It just means I have a very good imagination. All right. Uh, good imagination is healthy. By the way, whatever became of Nas? That is a story for likely another day. Although it is important to talk more about Nas, his current location is actually not exactly classified, more like being researched. It's a more complicated matter than we likely should be going into, but we'll just say that he is somewhat entangled in something, if that makes any sense at all. To be honest, on the matter of Nas, I'm not sure whether or not he is the threat that the world imagines him to be. On the one hand, it would make total sense for people to assume that he is some sort of apocalyptic destroyer. On the other hand, I knew him before he became Nas. I refuse to believe that that would be the case. It would be a complete reversal of who he was. Well, did he go undergo any, like, psychological break that might explain him going that way? That is a matter that we will actually be covering somewhat. From what I have heard here from Director Volta and the files that I have been able to access from the Stella Maurice Police Department, it seems that your group has been dealing with some things that are a little bit I won't say out of your depth, but you've been more or less thrown into the deep end without any kind of preparation at all. In fact, I'm surprised that you guys are alive. Sometimes so am I. I'm pretty sure I almost died recent. Yeah, we just kind of keep on rolling. I had heard that some of you even encountered Jason Valley. That is correct. If 
probably the same old asshole he was on the moon. Did he bite you too? Mm. Thankfully, no. It's not that I can recall. He was part of a larger sort of conspiracy that existed. Uh, there was a vampire as well. It, it, it was more or less fairly out of hand. And as a teenager, I... Well, I had difficulty dealing with all of it. Things have changed since then, of course. If I were to encounter those monsters a second time, I don't think they'd be able to stand up to me. He kind of smirks and then pushes his sunglasses up. It is good to hear, then, uh, that you're as mature as you are now. I had a little help along the way. At the time, there were also individuals who found themselves swept up in many different machinations and plots. But they never... They were never unavailable when I needed them. They never told me that I couldn't do what was necessary or right. And when fear was at its height, they helped me to get through it. And the depression and the anxiety. They were good people. I'm sure they're being as good a people as they can up there right now. But we'll talk about that, too. Calling them gods seems a little... He kind of, like, just shrugs his shoulders a little. Well, it seems a bit off. I wouldn't call them gods at all. More like vessels. Some kind of... They serve a role. Something we should also get into, I suppose. First and foremost, I think I should ask, are all of you prepared to hear the truth of the world as we know it? I would like to know the truth so that we can best adjust, yes. I mean, sure? I'm not, I'm not sure what you're getting at, but uh, I don't see how it would be a detriment. Very good. We'll start somewhere at the beginning. The very beginning. Is this projector working yet? He kind of motions for Director Volta to finish up what he's doing. Director Volta... Finally, once the sparks have stopped flying, it looks like he has uh, connected much of the machine together through a series of paper clips, rubber bands, and one small paper crane that's balanced on top of a transistor. He, kind of, he views his work carefully. The paper crane ignites, begins to burn, and then he gives Mr. Mr. Jr. a thumbs up. It is working fine. Mr. Mr. Jr. stares for a moment. You really are your father's son. Then he turns the projector on, which blazes to life, showing many different types of digital output onto a blank white screen, a blank white wall, rather, acting as a screen. Different green LED characters blazing in, burning practically with a very bright light from this projector. So it begins to form a combination of 2D layouts and maps and third dimensional holographs of, uh, well, a rotating planet. Mr. And Mr. Jr. points at the rotating planet. Does this look familiar to you at all? Likely not. But perhaps you've seen it somewhere. It's not Earth, if you're wondering. Is it Theia? Indeed it is. He points at the globe again. Before the dawn of time, 
as we know it in recorded history, there was another planet that existed near Earth, or it may have come from some other solar system or galaxy, perhaps even further away than that. This planet was known as Theia, and as far as any research has ever shown of it, it not only existed in the third, but also the fifth dimension. It possessed a certain special property to it, something that allowed it to transcend what we know as space and time. And we don't know why, but it happened to collide with the Earth. It exploded. The detonation was enormous. Theia itself was completely annihilated, and its parts were incorporated into the primordial Earth that we're walking today. I'm sure you've heard the number thrown around. 70% of the water that exists on Earth was originally from Theia. But we have more than just water as a keepsake. The doors that are used here at the lighthouse and by other entities throughout space are also Thean in their origin. They are the remnants of an ancient civilization, one which we live in the ruins or ashes of. There's other technology that needs to be found and researched as well. Uh, this already sounds like it would change a lot of perspectives. No. Likely so. It's not just the architecture and doors that we have Thea to thank for. The 3D hologram dissolves from a sphere and begins to transform into a the shape of a humanoid. He points to it. The origins of humanity lie on Thea as well. The origins? People in the room begin to whisper amongst themselves. You can hear someone kind of not so subtly under their breath saying, nice conspiracy theory there, Mr. Mr. Junior. I didn't bring my popcorn, but I should have. Mr. Mr. Junior adjusts his glasses. I'm going to have to ask you to shut up. Not because I can't talk over you, but because if you keep running your mouth, I may just have to silence you. He adjusts his sunglasses again. I thought you were a pacifist. He flashes a smile. Well, I didn't say I'd use violence to do it. Ah. We could just ask him to leave politely? No need. He brings up a series of diagrams showing different... Uh, they seem to be different classifications of human being. I'm sure once I start talking about all the sciencey stuff, those doubters in the room will either fall asleep or find themselves lost in the sheer amount of information. We're already in some wild territory, so what have you got? The long and short of it, and I can certainly fill you in on any details if you would like the more scientifically in-depth review of what any of this possibly means is that at one point the remnants of Thean DNA made their way into the earliest forebears of humanity those primordial mammals were altered by Thean DNA either through exposure to certain materials that existed within the waters or the crust of the earth or the numerous bacteria and viruses that were transferred from Thean ecosystems. Those viruses in that DNA, that biological inspiration, helped to shape humanity into the way we currently know it. Or rather, it led to a stronger sort of human than most of us are familiar with. 
the slide of the the hologram of the human dissolves away and a hologram of what looks like a very muscled man in a loincloth with tall he's very tall very flowing hair extremely well built man Mr. Mr. Jr. points to this hologram. This is what was referred to as a pillar man. Of course, that is just a name assigned to it by various researchers. I believe the pillar men themselves adopted this, made it easier to communicate with others. But the pillar men, and then a hologram of a merman comes up and begins to rotate. And this, a merman, are practically one and the same. Mutations of variation, echoes and callbacks to an original form, an original human species that has been lost to time. Something that researchers here at Rivers are referring to as a high human, a mythological being of sorts. Throughout time and history, Various heroes have attempted to ascend or return to this state of high humanity. Some have exceeded, some have succeeded, and some, of course, have not. Cars, one such pillar man, he points to the rotating hologram, nearly reached that peak through forced evolution and alchemy. He perfected his biological state. Unfortunately, there were flaws within his reasoning and his approach that made it so that if he were well for example launched into the void of space he would not be able to recover or at least wouldn't be able to come back to earth <sighs> on the one hand as someone from space I, I have to say this is a terrible oversight on the other hand I mean who could blame a guy for not preparing for that well, once he was sent into space, of course, he splintered off into several different beings, all containing some part of his original genetic, quote-unquote, perfection. One of them being a, an organism on the moon named Stephen Wonder. The other being, of course, the <clears throat> patriarch of the merman species of Vici. That is to say, your heritage and bloodline, your very birthright, lies in something like cars. A being seeking perfection, who sees themselves as separate from humanity, superior in a way. I mean, physically, that is true. From the records that we have taken, thanks to the documenting that the Speedwagon Foundation has done, conventional weaponry had very little to no effect on the organism known as cars. For really all intents and purposes, he was immortal. Okay, but, but you said alchemy? Isn't that like something from a novel or a, 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 a fictional thing? Like what? Alchemy. Right, he points a finger. I'm sure you'd like to know more about it. <laughs> Many people would. Don't worry, I'll try to cover some of the basics. Although a more advanced tutorial into the nature of alchemy would likely be given by Dr. Jake Holmes who strangely is not present at this meeting. Is there a reason for that, Director Volta? Mars Volta shakes his head. I will do my best to go track him down. In the meantime, I'm sure this will run fine without me. If everyone will pardon me for one moment, it's likely the good doctor is busy with his work. The room is kind of silent after he says that. Did I, Did I say that in perhaps some sort of socially awkward way? Or does everyone know what I'm saying? Uh, he puts his hand on top of his forehead and starts to slowly run his hand down over his face. If there needs to be some sort of correction, I can provide it. I mean, I, I think he did fine. He freezes. You can see that when he has his hand, uh, he stops when you say that. His hand is over his nose, and his eyes have turned 
somewhat more, we'll say, large. And there's a black domino mask over them. Are you sure? Everything's fine. Yeah. Very good. He lifts his hand up entirely, revealing his normal face. Or at least as normal as you know him, type A to B. I will go track down the good doctor then. Causing Causing Director Volta to take his leave. Dodged a bullet there. I really don't want his more socially acceptable quote-unquote side. You you mean type B? I think it's funny. Uh, I mean, you haven't heard his jokes and, uh, or anything like that. Spend some time on the moon. You'll see that he's not even the weirdest guy you'll ever meet. Well, do you have anything to say on alchemy before the doctor gets here? I can speak briefly on the subject. The Speedwagon Foundation did some research into alchemy, but our resources were far too limited. As far as we know, alchemy is a simple exchange of properties that exist between two entities. They don't even need to be organisms. They just need to be known entities, separate things. One thing exchanged with another, some property therein. There are many different applications of alchemy that have been used over the course of well, probably since before humanity even properly became humanity alchemy was being used by something or someone there are many different types of alchemy that have been recorded and also many different incidents that we believe to be alchemy uh, one of course would be the evolution of certain stands for example the properties that are transferred either from an organism to a stand or a stand to a stand or a virus, in this case, to a stand. These are different processes that would otherwise be labeled as magic within certain communities or scientific groups. But make no mistake, they are themselves a sort of science. We are not exactly sure where the beginnings of alchemy were, but we do know that He seems to fiddle with the projector and then only brings up the word, not the face, Leroy, and points to it. We think that one of the individuals who's responsible for introducing alchemy into the world is likely this one right here. I am not the superstitious type. He looks at the name, but I did request that we not put any photos of him up in the event that they start to move or speak to anyone. That does seem likely. They can do that? Uh, We've got the whole prophecy of the corpses. Among among other things, yes. We believe that he can speak here sometimes, influenced through images of himself, representations of voice recordings, things of that nature. All of them are extremely viral in nature. Even the name, he points to it again, is slightly viral in that those who know it are already primed to accept the existence of that particular being. The titles that he uses, such as Elf King, Antichrist, and many others, are another way to do this. As in, once you know them or they are introduced into the vernacular, it makes them more powerful by default. A mental virus like this, he points to the name again, would of course benefit greatly from alchemy because it allows them to steal properties from other individuals within this reality. So, could it do it through a computer? Likely so. Computer, a piece of paper, like a sketch, a tattoo, really anything that you look at or could see or understand. Even the blind can form some sort of 
thought pattern resembling an image, and that would even be enough if it were articulated properly. Huh. That's very fractal. So, yeah. as long as he's basically thought of, or there's a representation, his presence is there, we should assume. That would be correct. That's amazing. But before we get into that subject, the one of alchemy is important because it's related to all of you in a way. You see, Avicii didn't start out Avicii. Or rather, he just started it out as a sort of variation or spinoff of the Pillar Man cars. It was through alchemy that he was able to alter himself into the state that we currently know as a, he points to another word that pops up, Star Man. Starmen were, of course, more like you mermen, except they were adapted to the climate of space and all the different variables that are, well, cosmic. Uh, they are larger in scale of power and ability. Their molecular control is much higher than yours. But they also deal with uh, threats from their environment that require that. You see, Pillar Man, Star Man, Merman, all of these different types of cousins to humanity all have extreme adaptability to their environment, to their condition. Part of the way that's possible is through alchemy. They do it on a cellular level, able to shift around their very organs, their processes, adapt, survive, draw from their environment to empower themselves. In your cases, it would be aquatic life due to likely flooding and the vast amount of water that exists on the planet Earth. For the Starmen, it was cold, plasma. In one case, <clears throat> he clears his throat. Oil, which I thought was very odd, but she seemed like an okay person of sorts. That is to say, you do have relatives on the moon, whether you're familiar with that concept or not. I had heard actually rumor that one of them had come here without being allowed to do so. An unauthorized visit. Uh, you may have met him. A uh, Santa Gold brings up a large blazing picture of Santa Gold. And you seem to know a lot of people. He narrows his eyes behind his sunglasses at Santa Gold's picture. Uh, I didn't actually get to personally know Santa Gold. He was a baby back then. My God, what are they feeding these kids? Uh, speaking of baby, you said something about directors. Dad, have you met him? Oh, once upon a time. Yes, of course. Lewis Clark. genius inventor of the moon and he invented a robot or well, sort of like a second edition of an artificial intelligence that went on to become something called plotter and then eventually now mars volta huh, okay and his squint in your eyes hey here's a thought these pillar men, there's a lot of mythology in human history about giant people. There's no chance that they maybe, there's no mingling with humans, right? Mr. Mr. Jr. closes some of the holographic projections. That is actually one of the reasons I thought it was important to give this presentation. You see, at the time on the moon, there was a conflict between star men and humans. It was settled without too much death. But as a result, those star men that wanted to be peaceful were adopted as members of humanity. As in, they had a shared common origin on Earth through cars. 
At the time, the leader of the moon, a man by the name of Jeff Lynn, came up with some roundabout reasoning why it made them pretty much the same as humanity. But what he didn't know was that was actually not far from the truth. You may have remembered I mentioned high humanity, the original first species of human. Um, well, the humanity that we know, that includes me and most of the people in this room that are not mermen, we are also derivatives of high humanity, one that has been weakened over time. You see, the ancient enemy of high humanity and all humanity, merman and human alike, has been, uh, he points to the name Leroy, this one right here. As mentioned, alchemy was used to steal things from people, as well as objects, entities, anything. Over time, the Antichrist has been siphoning from and weakening humanity, along with corporations, which act more like his attack dog. Muscle, if you will. They take up space and drain humanity of attention and purpose. It was minor at first. Corporations just began as small banks, trading syndicates, that sort of thing. They would point people towards valuable resources and others towards famine, whatever was most profitable. They found ways to do it. Some of them even manifested as road signs leading to safe passage through a particularly dangerous area because it was profitable for the bandits to attack people there and sell their goods elsewhere at a jacked up price. The corporations have existed in the background for a long, long time, serving the Antichrist, using alchemy to drain the life force out of people, take away their fighting spirits. The result is what you see now. He brings up a picture of the modern globe with areas ruled by NWO marked very clearly. Practically overnight, the NWO has taken over as the leading authority in government, more or less worldwide, with few exceptions, one of which being your beloved island of Guam. But the NWO itself is actually a sort of mega corporation, a conglomerate of corporations, a union of them. They've been working in the background for this exact purpose, to eventually just take over with very little to no resistance. And they've managed to do it. There are a few more threats to them, but... You may have noticed the walls are tightening around Guam and Atlantis. That's the NWO getting ready to clamp its teeth down on you. Soon they'll swallow everything in this world and probably turn it into some sort of Dyson sphere advertising soda pop. Uh, there's no stopping corporations. This is bad. That it's only grown and become more pop... Uh, organized and was Leroy is behind it this whole time doesn't help what can we do to weaken this grip fine question we're not exactly sure currently we're looking at more traditional methods such as antivirals but there may be other things that are possible for example Mr. And Mr. Jr. holds up a very thin silver drive, almost like a chip. Detective Cornell, this was actually retrieved from the hands of one of your squad operatives, one who had died recently. We managed to find it on his person. Really? We're not sure where he might have gotten it from, but yes. I had your tech specialist, Rust, review it, as I am semi-literate in computers. <laughs> but from what I've been told, this actually could be a secret weapon against the NWO. It contains the security clearances that were granted to the agent that was dispatched to your island, Nathaniel Furneaux. I'm sure you're familiar with him. Yes. Uh, I am very familiar with Inferno. Intimately. 
Far too intimately. Because of your agent's sacrifice, we were able to get what could be possibly a back door into the NWO security system. And I do mean security systems, plural. It seemed that for whatever reason, and I have my guesses, that N for No was carrying around what was a skeleton key to the NWO security. That includes their holdings of digital currency, by the way, the one they're trying to get everyone to convert their currency into marks. It could be that on one part of this chip or another is a key, a private key of sorts, an encryption scheme, one that could totally undo their entire economic environment, their sphere could be dissolved overnight if it exists on this chip. This sort of security clearance is not given out to just anyone, which makes it even more bizarre that it was handed to a madman who decided to go on a killing spree on your island and in your jurisdiction, which leads me to believe he holds the key out towards you, Claudia. Leads me to believe that we were given this. She will kind of take it and go. So we could tap into their communications and get an idea. Like how, how would we use this information? He's saying it's a trap, Claudia. This almost sounds like it could be a, some form of virus itself. It may be a trap, you're right, or a virus, absolutely. Russ wasn't able to get back to me on whether or not it would check out for any of those things. But my theory is a little bit more simple than that. That man, the Antichrist, he works with the corporations, but he doesn't work for them. I don't think that he has allegiances like that. Sending one of his wild dogs onto your island with this valuable information and it just falling into your laps may mean that he doesn't like the NWO either. Strange, since he helped them to rise to power, but then I thought about it carefully. Mr. Mr. Jr. rubs his chin. Let's say you had a lot of different people and you were just very tired of really tired of and you wanted to just get rid of them in one fell swoop you might think of gathering them all into one location making sure they want to stay there and then burning it to the ground something tells me that the antichrist isn't interested in corporations or profits for that matter it may have been his mo to deal with these sorts of things as per the terms of alchemy to take more than you receive Corporations live by that credo as well. But in terms of organisms, it may be just a partnership of convenience and that convenience could soon be ending. Because as I'm sure you've heard many people say before, a new age is coming. And if I were the Antichrist, a being of that age and that scope, I don't think I'd want the competition from something like a corporation. I'm saying, I think the Antichrist has betrayed them. It is up to you whether or not you want to take that poison and use it of your own will. But I have no love for corporations myself and the NWO is certainly one of the worst that I've ever seen. Uh, so in theory, with the whole fifth dimension, the core of anything i guess would be some sort of memory or thought or dream right a concept or narrative is another way that it's been described would leroy be holding on to some sort of core like this himself that might be in conflict with what the corporations are after would be the case or he could just be a crazy son of a bitch. He doesn't seem like the 
type to open up to what he wants. So. Yeah, it seems really complicated and um, real confusing. Um, I mean, I, I, I get that putting out all your enemies in one place to go drop a bomb off would essentially get rid of competition, but what lies beyond that? Think about it. He points to a, a map again. NWO is here. Points to a further part on the map. Avicii, as far as we know, is here. And all throughout the world are scattered various remnants of Thea. He has, over the course of his career, so far as I know, been eliminating places one by one, defiling native ground, making way for corporations, and even at some point, working with Dagonites, making sure that all of these different factions are at war constantly, all rushing towards one place. Points to Guam. This right here, this central spot. If he were able to drag all negative forces to this one location, who knows what he could do? Wipe everybody out and act some kind of ritual? I'm unsure myself. He has essentially been puppeteering many different forces into either wanting to destroy him or destroy people that he has encountered. For the purposes, likely, of eliminating all competitors to the new age that is to come. So, was his use of the All Star kind of connected to that? Then, likely so. We haven't seen the full extent of what the All Star can do, and the reports on it come from times before antiquity. We only know that it has some kind of alignment with magnetism, and that's it. May I ask you a question as a samurai, Mr. Mister? Sure. If one wins a duel, the opponent's sword, who gets to, where does it go? An interesting question. Some of them fade away and some break, but typically a sword is not handed down to anyone or inherited. Family lines tend to have swords that are similar and may have characteristics of one another as is reportedly the case with those that were aligned with the All-Star. But when a duel is won or lost, sword typically goes with the one who wielded it. Typically. Have been any atypical situations, like a sword choosing its own... It, it, and the new master or something? If there were a sword that did that, it would have to be fairly powerful. Powerful enough to exist without a wielder, which would make it perhaps on the level of an all-star. Think of a sword like a stand. Then it'll make more sense, I think. From what you know of stands, at least, they are attached to a user, representative of their will, and manifested in their hand or nearby. Samurai sword is mostly the same, except that it has been contained or confined within the shape of a weapon. This has to do, of course, with the original metal that pierces the body to cause a person to become a samurai. A blade coated with antiviral properties, one that suppresses the stand within the individual. And I suppose this would be less of a problem to an alchemist? It's likely an alchemist could manipulate these swords, yes. Some have tried, of course. Not many have succeeded. These swords were crafted by what people would commonly call the gods. In mass, from what I know. Speaking of, he points to a hologram of the moon. This structure, we know it as the moon, obviously, the celestial body, is actually one of the largest remaining pieces of Thea 
as a landmass. It's said that at the core of the moon existed the well, largest portion of what was once Thea. The dirt, rock, and elements that have surrounded it since have formed this orb we now call the moon. Which is likely why it is such a source of psychic attunement, a sort of well, as if the souls that drifted from Thea called back to home. Do you think that that's what maybe the competition is over? To be honest, I'm not sure what exactly the competition of samurai is for. And you would think that I would know. It's one of the world's leading samurai. But the promise of great power itself seems not enough. Not nearly enough for the murder, the stress, strain, the fear, and the brutality I've seen in my fellow humans. Saddening to think that after all of that, the only answer is just a bigger, sharper sword. Could it be that I'm assuming souls from Thea are older than human souls, so maybe they're better qualia for corporations to feed off of? That may be true, but I, if I had a theory, would have to say that. It, likely has something to do with how the gods themselves, those spirits of the moon, those vessels, see humanity's struggles. Right now, on a stage, if you existed beyond the concept of time or above it in some way, you would probably see that everything is culminating into this giant pot cooking. Just as the temperatures rise on the earth, everything, battle, war, hatred, Love, passion, all of it swirling around in the earth. These swords may be just one way to change a thing, to change the resulting combination, to weed something out or to ensure a certain outcome. That's what would be likely, I would think, that the samurai that actually survives and wins the contest, the prize, would be a representative of the will of old humanity of those that have accepted the moon's graces and gifts. Someone to carry the legacy of humanity forward. Someone who's proven that they can fight despite the odds. That, I would say, is far more important than something as mundane as ultimate power. But I am biased to being a human. So someone that can edit things according to their will. Perhaps so. Or someone who can make sure that the stories that need to be told will be told. People will remember humans for what we should be, not what we were. Maybe the other way around. Nas has a different story altogether that he thinks should be shared. The flawed humanity, the humanity that plays of being gods, masters of nature, those that embrace war and evil. It must have corrupted him pretty badly, I'd say. You've all seen it yourselves in things like Soft Cell and the Knife Party. Humanity is a hateful, hateful kind. So can anything with free will that's alive. I'm intelligent enough, I would say. You're not wrong. I saw firsthand how bad things can get when I was on the moon, although it's probably pales, I'm sure, in comparison to some of what you've seen on the Earth in your formative years. As he's talking about this, uh, Dr. Holmes comes in carrying an armful of binders with a laptop balance on top of it. He has a seat right up at the front interrupting Mr. Mr. Jr. And then pops the lid off of a hot cup of coffee, blows on it, takes a sip, goes... Starts 
and starts blowing on it wow. loudly. Oh, am I interrupting? We were having a meeting that you're welcome to join. I was told that I should be here. There were people that were interested in my area of expertise for once. I sure hope it's for something other than losing weight fast, because if I have to answer that question again, I'm going to lose my mind. Actually, uh, we were talking about alchemy and fifth dimension and Leroy, so we could use your input. Actually, I guess I could use your input to know where it is that I would even begin to talk about. Are you done? He looks back at Mr. Mr. Jr., who's still standing there. You're done, right? It's my turn to talk? Or are you... Mr. Mr. Jr.'s uh, eyebrow twitches. Yeah, I can come back later to finish up what I was saying. That's fine. Uh, I, You are... <clears throat> Mr. Mr. Jr. kind of shuffles off. I mean, you, you've been here. You have seniority, I suppose, in this organization. I should... Takes a seat. Dr. Dr. Holmes uh, loudly sips his coffee while this happens and then gets up and walks over to the projector. My, My God, who set this thing up? He looks the machinery over. This is a mess. Top to bottom. How does it even run? How does it run? Hmm. Well, you all know me here. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Dr. Jake Holmes. I am a bit of an expert in my field. Meta studies, including metaphysics, of course. And I do hold a doctorate. And if you'd like to check it, I can provide you with a certificate or at least a copy of it. If you want to know what college I attended, you'll need special security clearances for that information. And as it currently stands, I am the leading alchemist on River's staff. No one does it better than me. And if they do, I can just steal it from them. <laughs> That's a joke. That's a... We don't do that anymore. All right, noted. We did just cover a lot of ground. I am fascinated of the topic. Of alchemy? Correct. Uh, well, there's a lot to talk about, but I guess I have to ask, what is it that you know already? I have just begun dabbling, at least accidentally. Most of the greats start out with accidents here and there. Sort of like the founding of different antibiotics. Penicillin is a great example. Just a casual mistake made with a mold. Next thing you know, boom. You killed a bunch of diseases without even realizing it. Or the nuclear bomb. You know, that one started out pretty small as well. The ongoing theory that they didn't want to document was that it was a way to keep somebody's hands warm. And it just kind of got out of control. Yeah, I'd say so, yeah. My hands are very cold. You can just blow on your hands with the warm air from your breath. From my mini lungs that, that I have, my tiny, tiny lungs. Just rub them together, mechanical, you know. <laughs> well, let's start with what you've known and documented regarding alchemy, because it's actually a very interesting thing. He brings up a map of Stella Marie in Guam. And points to it. You may remember this location. Points to the shore. This is where Dorobo set up some sort of, well, ground. They didn't say really what for, but they wanted to build something. Uh, I believe a murder took place here of a woman. Your group had been investigating. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, grim stuff really that. bad. She never got better, I'm assuming. She was found in pieces, so... Uh, yeah, that's a bad one. You really need a lot of medical insurance to cover that. Oh. Ooh. Please speak... Ref re uh, 
well of the dead? I mean, maybe a little bit uh, too crass. Sure. So the very nice dead person was found here, likely because they were going to disrupt some sort of building process that Dorbo was engaged in. But if we examine the site there on the shore with the industrial sites that you've all been investigating, the pentagram that has been found, we actually can see that there is a sort of combination of different... Well, he brings up a giant world map on the projector. You see all of these holy sites, including this island here, which I hear was pretty important. He points to Doma. And other sites in South America, some in Japan, China, Mongolia, some in Pakistan, all create, when a line is drawn through them, a sort of spiral. These spirals are important in alchemy because they help to condense energy. That spiral, of course, centers, he points at Guam, right about there. And with the pentagram and various other configurations, including a cross, which I have only just become aware of, it seems that there is a ritual being performed on your island. Likely because of, uh, well, alchemy. Something is maybe there. We're not sure what are or why the person would do with this. Are you aware of the pentagram? Oh, yes. All right. Yeah, we, 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 that came on our radar kind of right away, almost as soon as it did for you all and the information that we have been provided has also been very helpful. But uh, what I'm trying to say, really, is this is all basically a very large-scale alchemical ritual. Uh, this ex looks exactly like what we have seen before in smaller areas. The Brotherhood engaged in this sort of thing all the time. It's just never on this si sort of scale. Uh, there were doubts even that there would be someone that could control the sort of scale that was being performed on the moon. And the Brotherhood decided to just write off this reality at some point, as I recall. It's, and they thought it was a lost cause. This one, bigger than that one. Whatever it is. Don't know. <laughs> but I've got some theories. Well, we've got ears to listen to these theories. I'm glad that you do. This information that I'm about to say could change everything. Or it could basically mean nothing. I'm not entirely sure. Well, it would be nice to know why Guam is such a hot spot. Right. There is a unique property that Guam has. Most people aren't aware of it. Coral steel, when imported from Atlantis, actually is largely unusable if taken directly from the source. It uh, doesn't work quite right. Not as conductive, not as flexible, pliable, workable, bendable, anything. And attempting to melt it really doesn't work out too well. But once it passes over Guam, it becomes far more agreeable as a metal to work with, almost like a miracle of sorts. It's as if Guam is a sort of gate, or uh, theoretically, maybe, uh, due to its proximity to where Atlantis currently is, it may have been a part of the old Atlantean Empire at one point, where the landmass of it was before it was covered up by floodwaters, and then eventually resurfaced uh, as of 2095. Uh, so my personal belief is that Guam was once a very important place, perhaps even a holy place for ancient peoples. And just as other ancient land masses have risen from the waters due to the environmental problems that have happened all over the world, Guam has also risen. We do not know what its original name might have been, nor do we know its original purpose. But the fact that it draws mermen, the fact that so much trouble comes its way, 
the fact that it has this effect on coral steel and the fact that the Antichrist is very much interested, fixated, I would say, on it, means that you are technically some of the most important cops in the world right now. If this island falls, if the Antichrist has his way, I don't know what'll happen, but it probably won't be good. Thanks for the vote of confidence, but um, this alchemical ritual you mentioned, them. I know it's a little stretched to think it, we could even understand what its purpose would be, but is there even be a way to find out how to how to figure out what it would do theoretically? Okay, well. I can tell you what I believe that it would do, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it is what it is. So I would like you to keep an open mind about this and remember that I am working with just a lot of it is hearsay and legend. That is often what happens with alchemy. In alchemy, as you know, or maybe don't. The entire pursuit, as known by the layman, is to turn lead into gold. Uh, that is a very simple way of saying transmuting something into something more valuable, or in this case, the lead of mortality into the gold of immortality, which is why the Brotherhood, of course, highly values immortal immortals as minds and great thinkers. Wait, hold up. Yes? Thought of in another way since we're talking about magnetic so much when you think of lead you think of something that's heavy and not conducive gold is actually conducive i believe it's a much finer substance just a thought hmm could be the case coral steel is actually very very conductive when treated properly as well so you're right that could be related to the magnetics. In fact, likely is. Magnetics were actually used by the Brotherhood for certain experiments, though we didn't really see it as being necessary or as important as chemicals or just plain old-fashioned willpower. Right. Go on. Well, looking at all the different rituals that are surrounding Guam, the incidents that have occurred, those that you've dealt with and those that have been dealt with by samurai, and the fact that the samurai are here so much, and the fact that the Antichrist's attention is on this particular island, and considering the ancient history of Thea, I have a very mm, loose idea of what's happening. Very loose. And it is one theory of many, so please, again, hear me out. In alchemy, while the layman believes that the goal is to turn lead into gold, we in the Brotherhood had a different sort of pursuit or agenda. You see, gathering pieces of different realities and organisms would allow us to create a sort of mosaic or a total picture of something to solve a puzzle. That puzzle is the sum total of all data the entire collection of all knowledge of all things. It was believed that when combined and pressed into the proper shape, when the right properties were added to the pot, when the process was done with just the right mm, chef's kiss of accuracy and hygiene, that this record would be produced. We called it the Akashic record. Some knowledge, total knowledge of all things. This data is not just for reading either. It is believed that because it contained all data, changing one part of it could change that data. There may be a record that the change happened, but it wouldn't matter much. So, it's entangled enough so that if you change it in a record, it actually affects that, that it's pointing to? Indeed, you're right. 
Some of our forays into extra-dimensional travels revealed that there was actually an entire world made out of vinyl. This very odd plane, referred to, I believe, as Astro World, had, well, had hostile organisms, humanoids manifested purely out of vinyl, as well as a, I guess he was an alchemist, who had created the route, a sort of artificial reality. Astro World, whether or not the man who made it realized this, was a first attempt to prototype dry run of something like an Akashic record. Incomplete, imperfect, and honestly dangerous and volatile. We didn't really get much information from our visits and excursions to Astro World when I was with the Brotherhood, but. Uh, the lead alchemist and creator, Trav, uh, also wasn't very willing to work with us, and so there were a few skirmishes. I was not personally involved. I don't do that sort of frontline work. Well, I'm sure you uh, had your own personal thoughts on it, though. Did you support it? Well... If someone's hoarding a lot of information, it was usually common to, if they're not going to make a deal for it, then they'll have to deal with it. You know what I mean? <laughs> but I'm not, I'm not in that line of work anymore. I don't do that sort of thing. I just study and do work for Rivers now. You mean like, uh, what, like killing them? Dealing with him, it sounds like. If murder is really, that's just a... We, really, what is murder? When the life force leaves the vessel, sometimes it actually is transmuted into something more beautiful, like a butterfly. So in a way, you're just beautifying the world. But, but that just seems like murder. It does. To the layman, it seems like murder. To the alchemist, it seems like transformation, metamorphosis. Well, I think most people would want to transform themselves without the help of others. Forced transformation. Ah, funny you should mention that. Because just like there is in sort of a chemical centrifuge being formed here on Guam, there's another factor to consider that really had gone unnoticed until very recently. The idea of transformation metamorphosis one being into another. We've been also keeping tabs on some of your forays into dealing with the Dagonites on the island and have made somewhat of a breakthrough. Just a little one, but a breakthrough nevertheless. What have you got, Doc? Mikey, you provided the, you provided Rivers with information on that apple, right? That you found the weird one with the flesh in in it? Yes, I would have. Okay. In that case, Dr. Holmes brings up a small chart of that apple, complete with an x-ray of what was inside of it, which is gross. Looks like a person being crammed down into an apple shape. This fruit as it has been known, is perhaps the start of or basis for some kind of transformation. I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, Dr. Rob Tom. Hack, that he is. <clears throat> he was quite knowledgeable. He was helping us, yes. He was, until he decided to not follow certain protocols, and, well... Wait, you finished that thought. Do you know something about what happened to him? It, it, it sounds like you do. No offense, it's just that, um... The way you said it sounds like you know what happened. Um... He rubs the bridge of his nose. If there may have been some kind of thing that happened to him, 
I have to know that you all wouldn't take it personally or be horrified or uh, it would, I don't want to hurt anyone's morale here. So that would depend on what happened and how bad it is though. Wouldn't it? Not informing us would be obstructing a case in that which we are studying. Oh, you're implying that I would break the earth law that you enforce. Uh, you, I'll allow it. I don't want to hinder your investigation, officer. He holds his hands up. Uh, don't arrest me. I'm just a civil servant like you. Fine, I'll, I'll tell you. You've grilled oh, me. Yes, you have been grilled. We're not sure where Dr. Rob Tom is, but we are sure that this apple and what's currently happening to him are probably related. You see, he looks over at Mr. Mr. Jr. Did you give them the talk about humanity? Like as a whole, you gave, you gave them the whole human talk. Mr. Mr. Jr. adjusts his collar. Yeah, I covered it. You know, I, I'm just a samurai. I, Dr. Holmes shakes his head. I'm going to assume that he did a decent enough job. You see, mermen, humans, they're not distinct races at all, actually. They're just states or modes of one thing, an organism that existed at one point and now has derivatives all over the place. Uh, Pillar Man, Vampire, Star Man, even Yeti, uh, which I was surprised to find out, the Sasquatches that have been running rampant all, all over Canada. Humans, sort of. All from one source, one tree with many branches. Alchemy allows for one branch to go to another. Or, in theory, could allow a human to become a merman, among other things. This sort of alchemy was actually used at one point, historically speaking, back in England, I believe at the turn of the 20th century, uh, sometime around then, uh, somebody had gotten their hands on a very ancient relic of alchemy, a sort of mask, transformed themselves from a human into a vampire, something closer to what a pillar man is. Of course, that mask has been lost. There are others, but that one in particular, that was lost. What I'm saying is, I think Dr. Rob Tom may have accidentally tripped over the line at some point and is currently experiencing a metamorphosis. The apple right here, he points to it. <laughs> Further proof, unfortunately, that there is some sort of gene mutation that's occurring, a sort of uh, signal, like an on-off switch, a binary signal, signaling to something in the genetic code of humanity, do this, do that. And written within that code is, well, there are a few different lines that uh, are not originally going to be in a lot of different things, like turn on aquatic mutations and such. Ooh, would this be related to Santana cells, in a way? Likely so. If we consider that uh, pillar men... And humans are actually distant cousins. Santana cells could potentially act as a bridge between the two of them as they are able to infest human beings and thrive within their systems as well as make certain genetic changes, not unlike this fruit. They turn off cancer cell signals, for example. They turn on those that allow for longer age and also hamper things like reproductive ability uh, at some point even uh, will turn on, it seems, after a certain point, a uh, sort of dementia-like state, uh, likely as a sort of prolonged attack by an organism that wishes to cripple humanity, which is fun. I hadn't considered that that would be a weapon that would be employed in my time on this earth, and yet here we are. Without a lab, too, which is impressive, honestly, very impressive. So are we saying, Dr. Tom is becoming a merman? 
Or something worse than that. I mean, without the sort of guiding principles that help you all to become the fine, outstanding humanoids that you are today, without that sort of genetic structure, <laughs> who knows what he's turning into? Could be some sort of pile of tentacles, eyes, and teeth. Could be a small, tiny little shrimp that's just lost in a pile of goo somewhere in a corner, some office, or in a gutter really difficult could be really anything the there are a myriad of biological forms that life can manifest in shedding all the protein all the fat all of the bone you could do a lot with a human body really the organ skin the brain you can compress them down we i've seen it happen man turned into a sheet one time just a, a blanket just a blanket Craziest shit I had seen that day. Really. And he could still talk, which was wild. Real wild. I, I could see such a thing. I can shape flesh into many things. Oh, exactly. And I have a dog that I can turn into a blanket. You do? I do. Similar principles then, the sort of the physical chaos, unpredictability of those forms manifest through different abilities. Uh, I believe earlier reports of uh, Jason Valley were one of them. Uh, he was a stand user who could alter biological forms, physical forms, bone structure, that sort of thing. Uh, obviously, you all have some capability of altering your own structure, bone, face, voice, that sort of thing, right down to hair color and eye color. That All of those different little on-off switches that your internal molecular control allows you to manipulate. Well, those are just some of the switches that can be turned on and off. Really, you all have enough within you to just disassemble into your individual cells and just pour out onto the floor like goop. Just a bunch of jelly everywhere. Disgusting, really, yes, yep. but it could happen. That would be my key. Oh, we're talking far messier than, than Detective De La Cruz. We're talking, you need a, I, I don't know, you got to start spreading salt everywhere to walk. You'd be slipping around on your friends. So, could it be that the good doctor maybe doesn't have enough of a strong, how to put this, conceptual core to come up with something organized? It's likely he doesn't have that sort of fighting spirit, no. I can only hope he is abducted by Dagonites now. At least they would be able to teach him. I don't know if that would be what they do. Perhaps so. Perhaps they would. My guess is he would likely just be treated as a reject, something in between. I don't know. Dagonites aren't easy to always figure out they have different minds than i do but i will tell you that dr rob tom is merely just an unfortunate side effect of a much larger plot this fruit is an early prototype a step into the direction of transforming humanity as a whole and there's Something that's not good about that, in case you're wondering, why wouldn't it be great if we were all mermen? It's because early, and I do mean early studies of this particular gene sequencing alteration, this gene genetic injection, these levers getting turned, flipped up or down. My guess is that only one-fourth of humanity could survive this process. The rest would perhaps dissolve. Like, uh, what maybe happened to Dr. Rob Tom? Not sure. Maybe he survived? Mm -hmm. So humanity would be cut down dramatically, and there's no real way to predict who would or who would not survive this, as far as I can tell. And I ran quite a few tests. So congratulations. He claps his hands and holds them out. You have another doomsday to worry about. Just throw it on the pile, really. 
Uh, is, is there a way to look in to, I guess, raising the odds? Dang. Perhaps there is, but it would take a lot of research. Uh, and this is very advanced. If I could get my hands on the original person who grew this, and he wiggles his fingers, just a little bit of creative alchemy, I may be able to suss out some method to improve one's odds of surviving the transformation, but, you know. So finding Dr. Rob Tom would be of use to you? No, oh, no, not Dr. Rob Tom. He's... Yeah, Dr. Rob ah. Tom, if you see him, you should just put him in a bucket or an aquarium somewhere. Yes, the gardener who grew this fruit, uh, if I could, this is not just regular run-of-the-mill alchemy that was used to produce this fruit. This is actually like... Living it, life, maybe? Yeah, combined with really long-held traditions. Um, what I, From what I know of this case... Uh, that particular individual was aligned with the Higashikata clan of Japan, who have a long history of being involved with, well, alchemy, curses, that sort of thing. So we basically found a rarity. That's right. And if you deliver them to me, I may be able to help. Now, I have no personal stake in this, obviously. This is. I mean, I like working with Rivers more than I liked working with the Brotherhood, to be honest. It's a lot less mercenary and a lot more stable. I even have a vacation coming up that I can take. So that's nice. You know, I like, I like doing this sort of thing. But if this world falls apart, I got backup plans. You know, I got places I can go, places I can be. So, if your world falls apart and you don't have those places to go, you may be concerned and you may then want to just, yes, track down this uh, Zella, was it? And just bring her to me. And uh, I may have to do some surgery. Light, light surgery. Very light. Very anesthetic will be given. I would probably need to remove a few things, though, to study and replicate. You are talking of a colleague. No, who's that? What are you, this Zella is a colleague? I, I don't believe them to be. I don't... In the scientific sort of way, yes. She is a scientist, like you. He folds his arm. Look. I don't have the same sort of ethical dilemmas about this sort of thing as you all might. When it came to actual life or death dealing with this sort of thing, if another alchemist had a secret and they were holding it for whatever reason, we'd hold them down and then rip all the secrets out of them one by one. And then when we were done, if there was something more than a husk, we'd give them a chance to do better by society. But if it were up to me personally... I would probably track that person down, the one that you know grew this fruit, and then you don't have to be here when it happens, but, well, it is one option, that's all. Like I said, I have no personal stakes here. Uh, this is a young merfolk, so you'll have to excuse if we take it a little bit. Personally... I understand. There are, of course, ethical concerns when it comes to all forms of science and medicine. But I am offering you one way to do it. And if you do not wish to take that, that is up to you. I have to respect you as colleagues and co-workers here at Rivers. However, when humanity does meet its end here on this planet, I'm sure that those good feelings that you have will do well to shepherd them into the next life, which, judging by my estimates, will probably not be very good. As the new age turns, of course, the gate afterlife, entire soul transference will probably be disrupted, changed in the revolution, and made into a new system, one that will likely 
not be very nice for humanity, judging by the motives and reasoning of the Antichrist. I'm sorry, please explain. I have only seen hell. Well, you have seen a hell. You've seen one hell. There are more hells than there are words for the place. There are a lot of hells. They are a sort of bottom layer of garbage beneath all reality. Where broken things go, and a great well of gravity of sorts, spiritually speaking. Things are dragged down there when they are holding on to too much, cannot let go or accept and transfer up to a, a higher plane of existence. When someone's holding on far too much, and they are, well, pretty bad people, they go to hell, one of them. One hell. You haven't seen the real hell as we all know it in alchemy. You have no real idea what that hell could be like, because if you did, you would have already brought her here. But because you're holding on to the goodness of life on here on Earth, I'm going to assume that you don't know. And I think that's a pretty good assumption as a scientist. It was a very human hell. <laughs> Still human. Cute. That's good. That's good. That was a more of a coherent layer than. Uh, think of hell like a, like a pile of wet cardboard in an alleyway that people just are naturally drawn to and throw themselves into. Just all of it mashing together from gravity and friction. And then eventually you just pour a bunch of acid into it. And then maybe some parts are on fire and there's knives sticking out of other parts. Everybody's just throwing themselves on it. People are throwing more cardboard, TVs, refrigerators. We're all throwing our trash onto this giant cardboard sea. You were maybe on the top surface of it, I imagine, or... Um, you might have even just seen it from afar, sort of peripheral plane, close to hell. You don't want to go there. It's really awful. Really, really bad. And I mean that. I'm not just saying it to try to spook anyone or seem big and tough. I definitely don't want to go there. Yeah, um, here, on a lighter note, would it be Ideal, maybe, if we could get her to cooperate instead, and come up and cooperate with you. It's possible, if you could manage to get a hold of her, and she was willing to work with us, then maybe. Maybe we could work something out. But there's something else that you should probably be aware of, which is that the Dorabo group, I think, I believe, from some reports that I've seen, was also working on a similar sort of technology or gene therapy uh, but theirs was done through cloning and manipulations on vat made organisms so it's possible that if someone were to become aware of it they would probably try to hunt her down too you may, you may have, have several people that are interested in that sort of thing so kind of like this Doppelganger thing, in a way? Sure. Muddy the waters. Transfer souls here and there. Confuse everything. And I do mean everything. So that no one really pays attention to or can focus on the main goal. Doppelgangers are likely uh, one part of that. These changelings, these uh, physical shadows of people. If you could create those for mermen, it might make it very difficult for mermen to actually do anything to stop your forces. It's just a guess. You could flood the world with this empty clone, create havoc. And then everyone will be too busy dealing with that to stop you from what you want to do, which is great if you are the Antichrist. Uh, uh, so with all this in mind, have you looked at Maddie yet? I've done some research into that matter. The virus 
contained within those cells is actually not dissimilar from what we're talking about with this apple. It's just that there are more concentrated version meant to transfer something else into the genetic structure of those that it infects. In this case, the fifth dimensional properties that are being transferred seem to be aligned with coral steel, thus likely with, well, the origin of coral steel. I think that they are a way for the uh, young woman here, or she is used as a sort of vessel communicative to pass down the gifts of Atlantis itself to those who are compatible enough. Like a little chunk in your soul. That's alchemy. Uh, so, Maddie is natural? She wasn't made in a lab, if that's what you're asking. Well, Atlantis isn't made by artificial means, from what I understand. It's very much alive. Well, that depends on which Atlantis we're talking about. The old Atlantis, well, nobody really knows much about it. This new Atlantis, or the person that was named Atlantis. Uh, yes, I believe that they, uh, they are definitely alive. Technically, they were genetically designed, I suppose, by Avicii. Though, one wonders why he would make such a thing. Same reason for us. Correct. Well, who's to say that Atlantis also has... Well, of course Atlantis has free will. Look, basically, I'm just thinking in my head, Atlantis sent Maddie. That's true. Or at least we could say that's true. We're not actually sure. We assume Atlantis has a will. We don't know. What do you mean you don't know? We've never talked directly to Atlantis. We don't know if it's a thinking organism or if it's just at this point, uh, you know, nothing more than an animal of sorts. Hard to say. It is quite a, it was quite a big structure. If, if Atlantis had a mind and a heart and a will, it would be technically the largest organism perhaps to ever exist. Well, obviously you've never been, so... No, oh, I have no interest. Have you talked to Atlantis, Alnia? I haven't talked to it, no. Oh, I pity. I don't know, I, maybe it's just my imagination, but it, it seems to like certain things. Hmm. Humans also have a tendency to assign emotions and different independent thoughts to objects as well, and animals. I, I'm surprised that mermen have picked that habit up. I don't personally believe Atlantis to have a consciousness. I think that would be ridiculous. And his eyes start to shine a little. It, it, it likes peanut butter chocolate fudge wave. Like, Wait, what? And she starts mumbling to herself. I'm sure you've heard a story or two, but here's my theory. He brings up a slide in a small <laughs> animation. Here we see a chunk of Atlantis, just a wall. And then a girl-shaped outline appears on the wall, and then Maddie walks out. And then here we see Maddie being manifested spontaneously out of the wall. And that's probably where she came from. Happens all the time. Uh, I am told she has parents. Uh, really? He looks back at his animation model. Huh. Well, okay, let's say he starts making adjustments on his tablet. Let's say a woman walks into the wall, just bumps into it. She mm, gets pregnant from the bumping into the wall and then goes home, has a baby. Bam, got Maddie. That's it. He claps his hands together. Problem solved. That's exactly what happened. And you're squinting at this. I don't know. I suppose there are worse dates. 
Okay. I can see that all of you are doubting this, but here's another theory I've been working on. He brings up a slide of a baby. Here's a child. And then a doctor performing surgery on the child. And an oops, lost the coral steel forceps into the baby. The coral steel works its way into the baby system. They become Maddie. Memory loss, altered physiology, wonder baby. Uh, naturally, they are adopted because cute kid. Uh, nobody knows about the forceps, which were probably located, I don't know, sternum somewhere. Uh, it could be anywhere. Coral steel wraps around their spine, starts creating this virus. Boom. Got Maddie. And that's probably how it happened. That sounds like the least insane so far. I agree. Wait a minute, what do you mean by that? <laughs> uh, never mind. Here's a thought, though. Even okay, she was struck by lightning while she was on a boat. Nah, now we're back to... We're sliding backwards again. Fine, what's your idea? I'm sure it'll be make everyone in the room laugh. I, I, I don't have a, an idea on Maddie exactly, but I was thinking back on the whole Guam being some sort of holy site. Maybe, just maybe with all the magnetics, there's some sort of ley line we're overlooking. Some points that connect to other places that they all come to some sort of intersection at Guam or maybe at Atlantis. I don't know. Have you been talking to any weird orbs that float around and have dragons on top of them? No. Yeah, that sounds a lot like that Feng Shui bullshit we had to actually drum out of the Brotherhood of Alchemy, but ley lines come up. She furrows her brow. That's just a thought. I'm not a scientist. You're right. I am a scientist. Ley lines are just a uh, fancy pants sort of ma magic thing. Uh, they, they're not real. That's why I bring them up. We're talking about pentagrams for me. Ah, oh, never mind. I mean, that is real. Pentagrams are real. But how are they not ley lines, though? Like... <laughs> How? Could, so, it's only like first year alchemy students. Could not a human and the, and the merman, if they are combined, would they not unlock something new? Perhaps. But he looks at the, he, he looks, he draws up like a giant scaled version of Atlantis <laughs> and then adds a tiny little human model. I don't know that that would work. <laughs> I'm sure he was young once. He puts his fingers on either side of the model and shrinks it, the city, all the way down to human size. <laughs> what if I, you combined it with like Santana cells or whatever? It's a remote possibility. Santana cells act like a bridge. There are recorded merman human hybrids. They're rare, extremely. They don't live for very long either. They definitely don't have this viral component that Maddie has. To be honest, science may never know. I suppose we will both live long enough to attempt to find out. Well, one of us will. Yes, one of us. And it's going to be me. I am aware. I'm a mortal. Technically, we do not know how long our lifespan is, but I am cursed. I figured it's probably about as long as a human's, but I don't know for sure. I mean, you are mortal, but what if someone just kills you? Couldn't happen. I have a contingency, and you don't need to know about it. You just need to I, know I have one. 
I wasn't going to ask about it. Oh, I bet you weren't. I wasn't. I... First thing that happens when you tell someone they're, you're immortal, how do I kill that guy? Happens every time. We're used to it. I, I think you're just putting words in my mouth here. But I was thinking about it. See? Yeah. And if she I... was thinking about it, the rest of you were as well. I wasn't. Psychic transference. That's a word you made up. Empathetic I, absorption. I don't have Another to. word you made up. Mental osmosis. Definitely made up. Oh, Triangulation. Yes. I don't have that power yet. I think he knows. I think I know what he means. Right. The vibe, the wave, the flow. Speaking of flow, he starts uh, pulling up projections, analyzing certain events and their <clears throat> potential outcomes with the help of a kind of like lowers his shoulders. Feng Shui Master. God. The one you brought in, Kanapka? Yes, but uh, why do you ask? Oh, no reason in particular. Just that uh, if we analyze certain events that have happened in and around Guam, combined with what we know about the Dorbo Corporation, the New World Order, and the Dagonites, the progression of Avicii's forces, uh, encounters with different crowns, yada, yada, yada. According to the Feng Shui Master, which, again, clown school shit, really. Uh, according to them... Uh, there is an event that is likely to happen soon in relation to all of this other stuff, especially because of north, south, west, east accuracy and <clears throat> coordinates. Well, we just think that it's probably going to happen somewhere. He points off shore from Guam around here, which not coincidentally is guessed by the Feng Shui master to be the safest route to travel when transporting your prisoner, Danny. In other words, something bad's going to happen here, or good. It could be either one. A monumental event. Kind of like a ley line, not, maybe? Not a ley line. We don't use that word. But we use Akashic Record. Yeah, we do. Well, so something bad's gonna happen here, supposedly, according We're, to Feng Shui. We're good. Like I said, could be either one. A noteworthy event, then. Something like that. Whatever happens there, you guys will be involved. All of you. And it's likely that this was always destined to be the case in some way, set up, of course, by Feng Shui, which again, complete bullshit. It's all been coordinated. I don't know if I buy that it's bullshit. I'm seeing it in action. Would changing the directions change our flow of destiny? Center point of flow theory tells me that attempts to change anything involving it will just revert back to the original. Uh, you will make the attempt, certainly, but the waves will just push it back to the path it was on. Changing your fate is a little bit more difficult than changing your face. Well, I've only done one of those things. Funny enough, someone did attempt to change their face to change their fate. That's a that's a fun story that was told by one of the agents of the uh, Speedwagon Foundation and happened at some point. Uh, Japan. It's a really weird. It'll just some trivia. I've had so much fun going over the records that Mr. Mr. Jr. has provided. Just 
find it hard to believe that they weren't a comedic outfit with all the different little mistakes that they made and all the attempts that some of those people made to outwit them. Mr. Mr. Jr. shifts comfortably in his seat. <laughs> Uncomfortably, rather. They did what they could with what they had at the time. Dr. Holmes just kind of smirks. <laughs> they sure did, just like cavemen tried to make fire with rocks. Okay, well, there's something about Guam that makes it change or affect the state of coral steel. Like, it reminds me of the Bermuda Triangle, that it's something that can't quite be pinned down. But it's undeniable. Undeniable is certainly what it is. You're absolutely right. I would say, as an alchemist, my expert opinion is that Guam is likely a place of great transformation. Exactly the sort of place somebody would want to focus on if they were trying to define what the new age is going to be. When the page gets turned, it could be that the thumb is Guam. Determines what page it'll be and where the next part of the reading will go to. Guam could be a sort of focal point in that way. Just pretty interesting, I guess. It'll be a good note in a book somewhere. If people are still around to read books after this. Well, is there any particular part of Guam in specific that might be especially potent? Because that might be a place the Dagonites know about as well, and they would consider taking Zello there, I would think. The general aura of the island seems to be spread all throughout, so trying to locate it that way might be a little difficult, unless you're sp talking about a specific ritual. Creation of these alchemic fruits? I have no idea because I've never actually seen anything quite like this. Although, as I mentioned before, early studies in the, what the Higashikatas were doing did prove that uh, it was important to follow certain guidelines on where things would be blessed or not blessed. We actually do not know what those criteria would be. Even in the Brotherhood, uh, there was nobody that could really replicate what the Higashikatas did. And probably what Zella is capable of doing since she was raised in that tradition. Well, let's look at that for a second. There are obviously curses. It could be that blessings are the opposite of that. That could very well be. Seems likely, even. A curse is a sort of scar, psychic weight weighs down on a place. Um, eventually will drag it to hell or those who are afflicted by it to hell as well. A blessing then could be something that moves energy upwards, a sort of vacuum leading towards heaven, source of fate, that sort of thing. Curses go down, blessings go up. So I'm picturing once again, this golden spiral. Or it could be Mm. where you are right now it is a spiral the question is is it going upwards or downwards inwards or outwards it's all a matter of perspective and perspective is often key especially when dealing with fifth dimensional energy we don't have the perspective that fifth dimensional beings do we only have our working eyes their dimensional awareness and even someone like me who has dabbled in the far beyond, beyond, beyond doesn't have fifth dimensional awareness. I've dabbled a bit with fourth dimensional and not fun to do. You lose time very easily. Fifth dimensional must be losing entire realities. Timeline's gone and you see something else. A person could get fifth dimensional awareness and just <laughs> blip out of existence, maybe, or fall into a coma. So it would be bad to attempt. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, probably. Uh, uh, yes? Well, your stands give you the ability to interface and deal with some fifth dimensional elements, uh, but it's limited. 
Uh, I would. There was an experiment I could try, but I. Uh, you are. I do not know what would happen to my minds. Probably lose them. Could well. be fun. Tell them a reason to get Zella in so we could ask her about blessings as well. Maybe we should talk to Helmet. See what we can do about this event. Oh, I guess uh, my part is done here. Nobody else wants to talk to Dr. Holmes. Dr. Holmes. Dr. Holmes. Paging Dr. Holmes. He starts walking away. Oh. I mean, I did have a question for later, but not, not right now. I don't do later. He walks back. You're immortal. You have all the time in the world. Yeah, and you don't. Okay. Okay, I was just going to ask um, <clears throat> about fresh Santana cells, if they actually exist and where you could even possibly get them. Yeah, Santana cells are difficult to pin down because they are really biologically very similar to just regular old human cells. I'm sure you've heard this problem before come up with that hack, Rob Tom. Uh, the main issue, of course, is that we couldn't really tell if these were original Santana cells or simply Santana cells that have been bred within the person. Uh, getting actual fresh, untainted Santana cells for a sort of control group is very, very difficult because the original source of them was a pillar man that was being kept alive by the Speedwagon Foundation, of all things, but then also studied eventually once it was taken from their hands by different governments, some of which went to America and the other, which was taken to Japan and Nazi Germany. In other words, it's very, very difficult to track down original original Santa, fresh, as you call them, Santana cells. All Santana cells that we're likely to find, if we can even find them, are going to be derivative and grown inside of a person or a person-like person. If we could find our cousin, would that help? No, which one would you be speaking of? Mm, the gold man. Santa gold? Yeah, you likely wouldn't have any Santana cell uh, sort of tainting. He's uh, as pure as it comes. If my theories here are accurate, that his his system likely would completely resist or shut out any time type of infiltration from cells as lowly as uh, well the Santana cells. He he the spacemen are meant to exist within a complete void. Uh, that is, they can survive in a complete void, which means that they can also seal their body away from any sort of thing like that. Unless, of course, the Santana cells were to attack them. Now, in the battle stories that I have read online, there are sort of some attempts at trying to explain how a sort of uh, different, an alien organism could potentially infiltrate a completely sealed organism and infest them for the purposes of mutation. Now, in that particular issue, uh, Tsunami Man, who is the lead hero in the small novel that I'm reading, uh, does attempt to actually wash through the defenses of his enemy, uh, who is only known as the uh, Porcupine of Darkness. Now, the Porcupine of Darkness has an origin story that goes back to like 20 years at this point. I mean, it's a very long, ongoing story and saga. But really, the point here is that I just don't think it's possible. If Tsunami Man couldn't get through the Porcupine of Darkness's Invincicles, I don't know that Santana cells would get through Santa Gold's gold exterior. And yet, you believe the ley lines don't exist? Complete bullshit. <laughs> well, I think I've taken up enough of my time. I have busy work to do, and there are certainly some things that require a doctor's touch. And I mean a real doctor. <clears throat> Not one of those medical doctors. He kind of like chuckles and starts backing his things up. <laughs> My goodness. Then I shall not come to you without me as 
You can ask me whatever you want to know about alchemy, but if you're looking to further your education and move up to the big leagues, <laughs> I mean, I could help you with that as well. I mean, you could stick to, to I don't know what I, somebody's got a, a water on the knee or something. Maybe you could help them. As you wish, I suppose I could ask another as well. I've made my point. He starts to walk away with his just trailing papers as he does. There he goes. Yeah, he, uh, he just he just leaves kind of in a little bit of a huff. Uh, there's definitely a lot of arrogance in his stride. That man has uh, more ego than this room can contain. It is much amusing. We will get to uh, the debrief by Helmet. But uh, we are at the two hour mark, so you guys want to take a five to ten. And also, if you have other questions that are thought related that you've been like wanting to ask, uh, feel free to type them up or just think them and we like try to shoot them real quick so that you get some answers to connect the plot threads and everything. What related? No, just anything. Anything, okay. Any anything plot related that like you maybe have questions that you think okay. Yeah, you think Rivers may be able to answer. Um and any complicated lore shit they can try to simplify through their lens, like Mr. Mr. Jr. and Dr. Holmes have tried to do, although Dr. Holmes is a little bit of an asshole, and Mr. Mr. Jr. is just a man. There's only one person who knows all the answers. You gotta go talk to him later. Yeah. Palazzo. <laughs> yeah. Clearly it's Michael. Well, we will never get the answers from him. They're in there, though. If you try to attack Palazzo, he just says you will never reach, you will never reach home home base. And oh, Palazzo, no. And then draws his plastic bat. It's okay. We brought strawberry, so it'll be a battle for the ages. So just you just getting strawberry versus Palazzo is what you're telling me. Has nobody? Okay. okay. <laughs> Pretty sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was gonna say. Playing around. It's a it's a little boy who waves around a stick and has noodle arms. He's only obsessed with getting change and doing silly shit. You have pitted Palazzo versus Palazzo. Yeah, exactly. Battle <laughs> for the ages. Also explains why he never loses. Yeah, because he's the real main character. <laughs> of course he is. Pick up a stick and fight samurai and win. And get change. It's an easy life. It's a good li It's an honest living. <laughs> for, for Palazzo. Yeah, it's, it ain't much, but it's honest work. Yeah. Eat the shit out of a samurai with a twig. And then get shamed for doing so. Lewis, Lewis would be proud of the legacy. No, he wouldn't. Why not? Like a, a, a make, you make a robot that's capable of beating all these advanced combat combatants, and all it does is get changed and wander <laughs> around like an idiot. <laughs> it was the most adorable. But, idiot. but it still beats them, and that's what's important. <laughs> you, can't, you can't build a society on this. You can't like advance humanity I with this say, bullshit. I didn't say all the robots had to do it. Obviously not. Look, you, not you just need the one. Yeah, not every one of your children needs to advance humanity. Yes, they do. No, they don't. They can just exist. Nah. Oh. Sometimes you just gotta make one robot that has that dog in him and will absolutely beat anybody, and that is Palazzo. <laughs> Palazzo's just that one stupid Yu-Gi-Oh card. That Wait, like is what? secretly really like a Yu-Gi-Oh card that's secretly really good, but has very dumb artwork and a very dumb name. Is it like it's, a curry bow or whatever? Yeah, I was gonna say it's, <laughs> it's Max. It's Pegasus's entire tune deck. The entire thing is built around a bunch of dumb cartoon versions of the cards he made, and then they go inside a storybook that makes them unkillable. <laughs> And you can't attack the storybook directly with cards. It's a, it's bullshit. And of course, the creator is the one that made it. And you get beat up by Looney Tunes all day. That's it. I, I now know more about Yu-Gi-Oh than I did when I started this session. Thank you. I had no idea. <laughs>
Bless. I like the American dub because he has a southern accent. Oh. Up like a southern gentleman. Who does? There's a guy with a bandana Vegas? that's... Oh, that's no. Okay. Hang on. Maybe I'm, Jesus. Mis- maybe I'm misremembering. I never... No, I didn't watch a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh. I only watched that... What's it called? The, like, fake... I thought he sounded like a English gentleman because he goes to Egypt. You're right. And it's all kinds of, like... Implication of uh, him stealing artifacts and shit is kind of on the nose. All right, yes. No, take your five to ten minute break. (laughs) (laughs) No more Yu Gi Oh! Yeah, we'll talk about it when you get back. Maybe do it. Okay. Okay, be right back. All right. I mean, Yu Gi Oh! is already kind of JoJo because they just have holograms murder each other. You're right. And it shouldn't be real, but they definitely do kill people. I mean, oh of yeah, the shadow realm is... <coughs> especially uh, in this in this season where they have just battle decks on their arms. <laughs> like that, that shit just looks straight or up the real. Season after that, where they deal with the people from Atlantis <laughs> who have a card where the loser's soul is just just deleted. You just die. That's it. That's the entire card. No, I think you actually just get drawn into the card. Is the thing is you just you lose and your soul is it's now stupid. inside the card or some stupid. Shit. That would actually be funny if there was a like a a stand user, but with like a Magic the Gathering deck, who's just like, well, I got a mulligan, mulligan, mulligan. I'm not getting the right hand. This is bullshit. I forfeit, and then dies immediately to his own stand power because he lost. He's such a nerd. He just can't not win.
All right, I am back. I'm also back. I am back. You think that almost all of us? I'm back. Is there any reason we would want to talk to the psychologist? Uh, if, I mean, yeah, but we skipped a therapy session. Uh, yeah, like, can you picture us like in a little group circle, like sitting in chairs, just talking to our th it, dimensional therapist, I guess? She's here to help. But she is a therapist. 
That, it's funny that you do mention that because I did want to talk to her because me and her have not had a one-on-one -on -one discussion of the fact that my first conversation with her was not the first time we had talked, but it was the first time me remembering that we talked and she knew that and told me to remember that. And then I met her for the first time. Oh! What? Just seeing through time a little, Mikey. No worries. Yeah, I just had a weird temporal displacement mentally. It's, it's fine. Yeah, no biggie. Never really got around to closing that loop. Don't worry, it'll be okay. Uh, all right, sounds like everyone's here. Um, if you had other questions for any of these people, uh, including Dr. Holmes or Director Volta, or still, they still exist, um, ask them anytime or type them out in the chat. We'll get around to it. Um, for now, to pick up on where we were, uh, helmet crashing has uh, decided, obviously, to give his, part of his presentation to your group and answer any questions you might have on anything martially related, military, fighting, shooting. This is this is his wheelhouse. So uh, he. We begin kind of halfway in because as soon as he got up there, uh, he began just going over like all these different details of what you're going to do, where you're going to be positioned, best place to shoot people from, type of ammunition used, body armor that will be used on like other agents that will be there to support you, as well as coverage of air battles, uh, aquatic battles will also be necessary. Uh, he's going over frequencies that will be used and how not to interfere with them, as well as considerations that are given for supernatural entities that may be present, including psychics. He's accounted for this. And we'll be using a, a supersonic sound emitter to disrupt their thought patterns. Uh, he's going through all of this even more quickly than I'm rattling it off in like big, long, detailed lists that are presented with holographic displays of people, tanks. Uh, one of them just has a tiger. There's uh, a floating man with a cage around his head that seems to be spinning in place. Once he's done with the presentation, he kind of looks up from his tablet. Does anyone have any questions? It still sounds like a solid plan from last time. Maybe it sounds like you added a lot more, actually. I've more gamed out a few options added some in and uh well it's all here it speaks for itself airtight defense strategy plan we will make sure that you will be there without fail and not only that <laughs> i've even removed the self-destruct option that's how confident i am in theory this should be what guys like soft cells specialize in taking out these dagonites it's all on the line here, I'd say. Well, I don't know that Danny's that important, but he kind of is. He is. When it came to Soft Cell's organization, battle planning, uh, I'm the one who handled most of it, and they didn't always follow my battle plans. They went off on their own. And as a result, well, <clears throat> it doesn't matter because we have all these. He points to some of the detailed structures on the holographic display. His boats here will be carrying uh, munitions that are important. Uh, it's also a three-week food supply. Uh, I, I should up it to four. You're right. Four-week food supply. Nothing's going to happen during this, uh, you, and no one is going to die. I'm 
really accounted for everything here. Oh. You cannot blame yourself for that. What'd you say you were quiet? Oh, you cannot blame yourself for that. No, of course not. It's not my fault if people don't listen to what they're told. And if they decide to go off on their own, that's up to them, too. Right. It's important to stick to the plan. So, I think we're all on the same page, though. Fantastic. To ensure the success of this mission, I'll be accompanying you as well. Unlike Dr. Holmes, I am a field operative. It's where I really belong anyway. If you really feel that way, then of course. I'm glad to have you along. Presence will help ensure things go smoothly, in fact. My dog is crying in the background. What is he demanding? I don't know. He's demanding that the helmet crashing not go on this mission. Mm. Or he's demanding uh, chicken. Yeah, probably that. Chicken only wants to be part of the team. Put me in. I got. I got a sheet ready. I got. I got my stunts. Oh, does he? No, he doesn't have shit. No one v one, Danny. <laughs> Fucking come at me. Come at me, Beachy. I'll be up right now. <laughs> got an aspect. Uh, kill. We'll kill Avicii. Yeah, whatever. Canoli's not playing. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up right now, so it's fine. <laughs> Helmet crashing uh, just fades out all the war models. Uh, you can see that as he's doing it, they're still running simulations uh, with percentages changing of victory, death, casualty, uh, munitions spent. All that information is still being calculated as the display fades out, indicating these calculations are still being run by him. If anyone has any other questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Otherwise, I will see you out on the field. Actually, what are the chances that NWO is going to get involved in this? Do you think? Roughly 30 percent, 33, something like that. One third of a chance. And is there a plan in case they do or we wing in it when if that is the case? I am the plan in case they do. I have a backup, of course. Uh, something I hopefully won't have to employ. I'd rather not talk about it, but I also know that your group isn't the type to like people holding information from you. So, well, I mean, would it be better tactically if we didn't know? It wouldn't matter either way. In the event of a crisis, we will be employing the Egregory of Justice as a long range support unit. And Again, just a double take. I would rather not have to do that. He has, presumably, an unlimited range of fire. Uh, wait, you mean to tell me you got your hands on Clint? If that's what you want to call him. We do have him in containment right now, actually. Same subfloor as where we have the Antichrist. And one or two others. Huh, we did tell the Chief about his whereabouts. Is he all right? Can we see him? I wouldn't recommend it. He's not himself. Since being captured, he's 
reverting back slowly into a more uh, warlike mentality, the violent part of justice, I guess you could say, the part that, uh, uh, in his own words, cowboy justice. So, is he armed? I guess I'm trying to understand how can we trust him. Everything's a weapon when you're at that level, so it doesn't matter. Give him a gun, it's more of just a prop. He could probably shoot you with just a lack of a rock. Kev, uh, Clint, whatever you want to call him. The Aggregory of Justice has the ability to project over space anything. Send anything through a space. That means everything is a bullet. And he is the gun. That means we can use him to snipe from very long distances. Presumably, he could probably shoot the moon. Like, from the ground, which is pretty good. Considering he doesn't have a, a rail gun or a rocket system attached to himself, uh, his offensive capabilities are quite high. So, we have both the Antichrist and an Egregory in custody? Completely sealed off from one another, but yes. What would you say happens if they collide? Well, if they did, we wouldn't be here. We'd probably be dead. Explain. What is there to explain? If you're on a nuclear-armed submarine and I told you it was being powered by some sort of fusion reactor, you'd understand right away what that meant. What we have now are several fusion reactors in sealed chambers. They don't communicate with one another. No energy signals between them. I understand, but isn't one sick because of the other? That is a more complex question than likely I am ready to answer, but I will tell you that it is possible that one does affect the other or has affected the other in some way in the past, and maybe in the future, but in the present right now, they don't. I've done everything that I can to make sure that shielding is absolute. Working with the director, of course, and Dr. Holmes. Would you, we best ask this question? Uh, probably Dr. Holmes, I would assume, but if your concern is that having one close to the other is a problem, then I can see why you would think that, but prior to this, they were both just existing in the world, running around rampantly, doing whatever they wished. This is actually far safer than it was previously where the Antichrist could just influence whatever he wanted willy-nilly, including possibly the strongest canon in the known universe. No, well, it is not so much a concern, so much as a consideration. I know that one creates a forest and the other is lost in a forest. You can see how I am adding up things i'm afraid that i don't are you in what is it that you're getting at one may already affect the other he lowers his tablet and holds it by his side so what do you recommend then i Short of me personally going into the purgatory space and retrieving Kev, I am unsure. So, without any prior training, you want to approach an egregory like that? 
it would <laughs> it would involve approaching someone else first. She pauses, looks around for the book that said uh, Leroy's name in it, and then just stops herself. Let me make myself perfectly clear on this. Because I am the person in charge of military operations here at Rivers. Trying to approach any of the egregory without any kind of protection, instruction, training, is like trying to deal with uh, well, uh, something very radioactive. Not only do they just permeate everything around them with a sort of energy and psychic signature that does exactly what you're saying, create spaces, but they also influence people heavily. It's more than likely that several of you have been technically psychically irradiated just by being around that guy when he was incognito. It's just pretending to be a police officer. Is that not a good thing? I don't know. You tell me. You saw him when he was having some sort of breakdown. Happened more than once. What do you think? Does that seem good i don't know about the breakdown but i know about him teaching us and well he was our friend and a fellow mm -hmm. officer let's make one thing clear he may be your friend he may have been a fellow officer he also killed a few operatives when we went to retrieve him because he said his wife told him to in case you didn't know she's been dead for quite some time we had to track down his position and employ many different forms of what I would only refer to as crowd control to even begin to actually approach his position and convince him that we were not a threat. Even then, he probably would have killed me if he didn't have a flash of lucidity and decide not to do it. And that's the only reason I'm even standing here is because he decided not to kill me. He may be a nice, friendly teddy bear to you all, but to those officers he killed, he's the last thing that they saw. Were the others as difficult? Like you said, there were others, so... Matter of fact, there were. We sent a team after an organism known as DZ, someone who would probably come here been drawn by the curses of Japan. She was attempting to do something, but in the effort had been more or less enshrouded within a sort of cursed energy, a very offensive, destructive force capable of doing quite a lot of damage. We lost several Rivers agents also pursuing that, but we were able to contain her. We did so non-lethally as to the best of our abilities. Same with the egregory of justice, Clint, you like to call him. Our objective is not to destroy them. We don't even know if destroying them is possible. It's to capture and keep them safe and more importantly, other people safe from them. So we have two at Gregorian custody. That's impressive. He rubs the bridge of his eyebrow. It's more like four. There are others that we've captured. Four. Really? Four? An organism known as Rich Tan was captured gambling his life away somewhere in Vegas, the zone that is continuing to perpetuate itself as a hedonistic paradise. We managed to take him in fairly easily, although he did explode our first carrier truck. And the other one doesn't seem to have been named yet, but is extremely deadly, and we are just doing investigations on that one right now. But... They are likely to be the egregory known as Germanata. That's our theory on that. Has Dr. Medley talked to any of these beings? 
Dr. Medley uh, leans forward and clears her throat. I, I have, on a limited basis, they still do have uh, human personalities and psychologies somewhat. So it is possible to speak with them on very limited terms. I don't know, guys. I still sort of want to go talk to Clint, Kev, who or whatever he goes by. But I understand how that could be something that's ill-advised. Helmet looks back at Dr. Medley. He seems uneasy but nods her head one and then speaks up again it may be possible to have limited communications through a speaker system with any of the egregory um save for Leroy. uh he is considered to be highly dangerous and mentally contagious. So we try to limit those interactions so as to reduce threat levels um, here at the lighthouse. All right, how do you guys feel about it? I mean, I'd, I'd like to see how he's doing, but if, if we're talking to Kevin, not Clint, then I mean, it's kind of not the same person, right? We got to see what it was like to be them, remember? We have an idea of what they're like. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, he, he doesn't know that. Not really. I feel like that'd be a weird thing to breach. Yeah, I'm, um... Maybe we just take it a little slow. We figure it out, yeah. Yeah, we can figure it out later. Right now, we gotta focus on this. I mean, perhaps... After uh, we get Danny into custody, we could really think about visiting with him. That's my opinion, anyways. So you guys don't like it? I think we should talk to him through a speaker system. Oh yeah, I'd be totally fine with that. That's all right. We can bench it. It was just a thought. We do mm. have a lot on our plate. Helmet nods his head. I understand that he is a former friend of yours, but he barely recognized his own daughter. Just so you know, he is not quite human anymore, or he's not who he was before he became an egregory. They are not people. Not anymore. There's something else. Reflections or... I think vessel was the word that was thrown around. They're like psychic lightning rods. And they permeate everything around them. Is it so bad to permeate justice? I don't know. Should probably ask. Mikowski. Vandalin's cross. I should ask them what they think about permeation of justice because they were permeated right between the eyes with it. More than just a cute novelty or distraction or anything sentimental. Danger is danger. It doesn't wait for you to figure out why it's dangerous and it doesn't take a time out while you try to consider some of the different moral or ethical concerns about what danger is or how to stop danger. Death comes when it comes. Right now, that egregory is quite deadly indeed. He tried to put a single penny through several inches of reinforced glass and steel. And honestly, I think he probably could do it if he really tried. 
I wouldn't take that sort of thing lightly. Noted. He looks around the room. I'm bringing the mood down. So let me just wrap this up. Operations will be secured. Don't worry about it. I'll be on hand and fully responsible for any failures that occur. I take great pride in my job and position and the faith put into me by Director Volta. I won't mess this up. You can count on that. He closes the projector down. Any other questions can be forwarded to my voicemail. He has a seat, looking rather grim. Noted. Director Volta clears his throat and looks around the room. And quickly gets up from his chair. Gosh, that was a really grim sort of speech you gave there, Helmet. Everyone's really feeling down and bummed out. The woo, he stands up. I know, let's talk about things that are good and cheerful for one. We could, sure. Perhaps we should just prepare for the mission ahead. I can help you prepare. <laughs> He gets up and starts bringing up projections of what look like uh, pictures of him just around the lighthouse, uh, hanging out and posing with different people. Here's me with the guy who sweeps up the floors. He's a cool guy, but I don't remember his name. I think it's Teddy. Here's me catching a sandwich. Now I can eat a sandwich, but I don't digest it like everybody else. Occasionally, I only pretend to eat food, but I just take imaginary bites. And here's me just giving a hug to the egregory of justice. He shows a picture of him <laughs> hugging a very dark figure covered in, looks like just guns upon guns strapped over his body. Oh, I know he didn't like that. He didn't. Uh, listen, maybe, look, I, I think you should learn the difference between being uh, energetic and uh, getting in someone's personal space. Would you like a, a picture with me, Mr. Kubi? Mm, which one? Which one of you? He points it all around at you. You, I speak in particular, he's pointing at your head, your shoulder. <laughs> she actually brightens up a little. Of any one of me, all of me, would you prefer the male thing? Why not all of us? Oh, like a group picture. Yeah, we're all in this together, right? Okay, everybody gather up. Everybody in the room. Except for the people who don't want their picture taken. Can I go? I grab Claude. <laughs> well, someone has to take the picture. <laughs> Oh, yeah, my, yeah, Mikey will jump into it. If need be, he will hold the camera and just stretch his arm out. Okay. Yes! Everybody who's, like, here, more or less, is gathered up for a group photo. Mars Director Volta is just trying to jump from behind somebody to be seen in the shot. <laughs> and you can, can pick I him up. <laughs> okay, you pick him up. Uh, he's not very heavy at all. Yeah, he's going on the shoulders. Uh, the snapshot is taken of your whole team. There we go. Yeah. Nice. And you now have a framed photo of yourself with the staff of Rivers, uh, Kind of just, it doesn't just, when you take the photo, it's like sent to a fabrication machine that's nearby and it prints out in a very thin metallic frame. 
uh, a picture of all of you. And it's enjoyable to have a, a photo of all of you, all of you together. Like it actually to look at it is somewhat mentally stealing. It's like you have a piece of reality right here, a snapshot, a freeze frame of a time when you had things under control and everyone was just here. Dr. Dr. Holmes looks the photo over once it prints out onto the fabrication through from the fabrication machine. Picks it up, looks it over. Oh, I look bloated in this. Can we do another one? Right. I'll come back a couple weeks, hit the gym. Oh, if it makes you feel better, I don't think this picture should leave the tower or lighthouse. And we all know what you look like. It's a fine picture. Put it on a wall somewhere. I don't care where it goes. Mr. Mr. Jr. also looks the picture over. He just like smirks a little. Yeah, but still got it. Karenella seems not, not impressed, not displeased. She just nod. Helmet, uh, Trust with Justice hair when he sees what it looks like in the picture, but it's still just, it looks like it does in the token, no matter what he does with it. Yeah. You know what? We could take another one after the mission. How much nods his head? It's probably a good idea to have a before and after. Mission successful. I thought so too. Well, he starts to wrap up his presentation, uh, occasionally pushing Mars Volta Type B out of the way. Uh, like I said, if anyone else has any other questions, uh, feel free to send them to my voicemail or email or whatever i'm not always in the office but i always have time to respond in a timely manner he nods to your group and then leaves the uh center front of the room uh leaving dr carinella to make her presentation finally She steps up in front of uh, everyone and begins, opens a notebook style tablet bound in black leather. I will be brief. As you know, I am here to speak to anyone that needs therapeutic services as you are dealing with the unknown and the strange and the otherworldly. It is my area of training and expertise to be able to coach people through these sorts of things and ensure that you retain some shred of coherence. We are not encouraged to call it sanity or insanity. Some people do use those words, but uh, they're not helpful. And also, some people are not insane. Uh, it's likely that you have all experienced things that are considered to be quite extraordinary and if you tried to explain them to a normal person they likely wouldn't get it but as a therapist i do that's why i'm employed here at rivers i can also help to assess the psychological profile of those that you have encountered in the event that you wish to know more about them from that clinical point of view of course Unless I treat them personally, I won't have the most accurate of portraits of who they are. But I can maybe provide some insight whenever possible. Hmm. He clears her throat and looks around the room. 
I... Actually... I... do have sort of a situation. Oh, was it something you wanted to speak about in front of other people, or would you prefer to schedule an appointment? It would probably make more sense to schedule something, but just speaking loosely... Something really... radical would have to happen for somebody to change their entire world view. Right? Well, well uh, that depends on what you mean, but if you are referring to someone experiencing a rather um, radical transformation of personality, it's possible that that sort of thing always existed beneath the surface and only now is being shown to the world, but no one just changes out of well, nowhere, unless we're talking about a person who's experienced severe brain damage or something. Have you met someone that you believe is experiencing this sort of thing? Uh, I think so. Uh, I used to be a certain way. And then this individual changed me. I'm just having trouble to believe. I just can't believe that they would be what I was. I'm trying to wrap my head around that part. Sorry, I probably should just schedule an appointment. No, it's fine. You'll likely run into this sort of thing in the field, especially as you deal with more uh, mermen who maybe are in a similar situation to your own. Uh, I would say that it's well, merman psychology is very different. You are all by default veterans and survivors in a way, especially with how you treat extreme stress, uh, likely from just the conditions of birth and life as we know it. You're necessarily those who have to deal with very harsh realities in this world almost immediately in some cases. Because of that, you may run into someone who has a similar experience to you, but they went a different way. Or even someone you grew up with turns out very differently than when you knew them uh, as a youth or the limited amount of youth that our men are allotted when they are. Strictly speaking, uh, it's difficult to apply developmental psychology and the tools and knowledge from that into mermen for this reason. Um, but the long and short of it is, I would say that the person that you are trying to reach likely still has inside of them the part that you are familiar with. It's just that it may now be buried beneath other layers of could be coping mechanisms, uh, psychic scarring, all of those sorts of things, just as the part that you are now familiar with was buried under other aspects of their personality, such as expectations, life goals, dreams, you know, uh, m more of just an inversion, I would call it. That is also something that happens, and we have noticed it with Merman too. Merman, who is normally nonviolent, they suddenly become violent because it is part of their will to survive, their drive to survive. And they may become violent in situations that are not necessarily those that are life-threatening, but are seen them being the same scope. Social pressures. People do the same thing. Humans definitely do the same thing. It's only that we cannot manifest biological weapons from our bodies, as many of you can, which is good for us, because if we could, well, it would be a much more dangerous world. Right, and it's hard to have a conversation in the middle of a battlefield, so... I guess I'm just wondering... Do I just try to cinch this, or... 
She rubs her face. <sighs> it's just hard for me. Yeah, I'll just stick to the mission. If you feel for some reason that you are not capable, mentally speaking, of handling a task, you can always choose to sit it out, detective. If you think that you might become a liability to yourself or others because of a conflict that exists within you, then you do not have to take that fight. There are a lot of words being thrown around by my colleagues here about apocalypses and this and that end of the world, but what's the point of saving a world that's always on the verge like that? And moreover, if you always feel like you were the one who's responsible in some way, who, if things go badly, it will be on your shoulders. And even saving one person can feel like that, can't it? You have to take care of yourself first or else you won't be able to save anybody or help anyone find peace of mind or just peace. You have to steal yourself. You understand what I'm saying. Nobody would think less of you. This is going to sound extremely stupid and shallow, but if reaching this one person meant throwing the rest of the world away, some dying chaotic world, I'd heavily consider it, but I know that's immature, and I am up to this, so it just is unfortunate. I think I understand what you're saying. We all have people like that in our lives. I trust that you'll do what's right, I think. The way that you speak about them tells me that where you come from is a place of love. Sometimes that intention is enough to make sure that you don't make the wrong decision when the time comes. Not exactly therapist talk, more just personal mumbo-jumbo, I guess. Yeah, all right, I'm good. She kind of nervously looks around. Oh, um, if we could schedule an appointment as well. Oh, yes, certainly, Detective De La Cruz. I, I keep my schedule open for especially operatives who are in the field and those who have had personal contact with the egregory and you all qualify as both so certainly of course oh perfect uh, then yeah we'll get that all squared away and he does a finger gun he awkwardly finger guns back right does anyone else have any requests for again scheduling is is actually simple there there is an uh, an app for the uzik that you can use um just scheduling whenever is appropriate her phone dings yeah she, there's probably another ding <laughs> she as she's talking she goes to say something and then the ding happens what well, um, um then another ding <laughs> Right. It's, um, well, the, good. We, we're aware of the app then. Good, great. I didn't really need to say anything, but it's good. It's always good to, to have a reminder. Um, I, of course, will not take up very much more time as my services are more often and more well received given in one on one sessions. But I will say also that if any of you are experiencing any sort of supernatural phenomena related to any interactions with crowns or directly somehow with the mind of Avicii, it's likely that you would also require perhaps um, a one-on-one -on -one session or at least an assessment. Um, 
it is important to be able to um, kind of take a closer look at things that you would maybe write off as insanity. Um, unfortunately, most people do, especially when encountering beings with very complex minds and psychic influence. It's it's not insanity. Remember, we do not like to use that word. It's more like um, bleed over or that sort of thing. It's a, a leak or a, a flood in some cases, but it's sometimes a lot for the mind to handle, even minds as complex as um, as a merman's, which are, they're, they're very complex, actually. Thank you. We'll take that as a compliment, I guess. You should. Um, there are certain developmental problems within humans that simply do not exist within mermen, which is fascinating to me. An example? Uh, well, uh, just, uh, okay, as an example, um, obsessive compulsive disorder is something that mermen apparently don't have. Uh, no, there's no record of that. Uh, there are mermen who are fixated upon certain subjects, do not get me wrong, but uh, they do not have the other symptoms related to that particular um, condition. We're not sure why, but it, it probably has something to do with uh, the brain's ability to organize information and uh, pattern recognition within, within mermen, which seems to be a bit more complex than it is for humans. Uh, the signals perhaps are not as mixed up um, in some cases. Also, um, various um, conditions related to uh, phenomena such as phantom limb syndrome don't exist. Although, well, I put it another way, they do exist, but it's usually because their actual limb is still somewhere and even um, viable as in still the cells are still alive and can be reattached. So that is also a very fascinating thing. I've read from early accounts of samurai encounters with mermen, um, where in a story where one had an arm removed and knew where the arm was and in what condition, which was very dry. They felt like they constantly needed to lotion their arm. And wasn't it Dr. Holmes that said that mermet, merfolk have a core that's immune from viruses? Well. Or harder to penetrate, I think it was what he said. Yes, that's more of a medical science um, question. So I, I only have passing knowledge, but yes, I believe that is generally accepted. It is a more difficult to um, to penetrate sort of biological and psychological core, I believe. Are you able to deep dive into an mind? Deep dive how? Connection mind to mind. Are you asking if I'm psychic? Well, sure. No, I am not psychic. Would you like to? Doctor, this is a very strange question, I think, to ask me personally. Um, would I like to have psychic powers? Absolutely. Would yeah. I like to engage in some sort of mind psychic experiment with you? I do not think that that is a good idea. Mm. Is there a particular mind connection bridge? Uh, Yes. Well, I have made several, but the first was with Rihanna, uh, Crown of Brains. And ever since that, there has been a tingle, and I think I could access it again. Ah, uh, you, you're speaking of the communication bridge that exists between crowns and mermen. Um, psychologically speaking, we do not understand that one too much. Dr. Holmes has done research into it, I believe, as has Director Volta. Uh, but as far as the mental part of the equation goes, because we're really talking about a biological process, um, I can perhaps provide some insight. But um, personally speaking, in this line of work, 
it is best to keep your mind air gapped. If you know what I mean by that, um, it's an old, um, uh, yeah, you know, it's a computer security term for keeping a system wireless, as in not connected to other things, no receiving, no sending, air gapped. Well, I, last time we had the on the air gap, this was not great. Yes, uh, that is a very common problem in this line of work. I keep my mind fairly contained. Is it possible to make your mind sharp enough as it could be a weapon? Are you talking about weaponizing psychic abilities? Well, other than stance, but my stance may be able to do such connections, and I want to be able to defend myself. Kind of narrows her eyes a little. Aren't you supposed to be a doctor? Are you, is this the application that you would take with psychic ability is combat? I may be doing psychic combat in the future. I am, must apologize. This, that is not my field of expertise. Do we have a field of expertise in this? Well, uh, what about, like, I guess, psychic defenses? Is there a way to learn how to better protect our own brains from their effects? Maybe not necessarily, like, a brain weapon, but maybe like a brain bunker. Uh, yes, actually, I have been working with Dr. Holmes to help formulate a series of experimental psychological medications that could help you to resist or buffer yourself in the event that you have met a sort of, well, surreal level of mental stress or strain. I think, actually, he has supposedly provided you with some... I'm sorry if that violates doctor-patient confidentiality, but I don't believe you to be his patient. Oh. Oh, yeah, no, he did give me that. I didn't know that was exactly what it was for, but okay. Good to know. Wait, are you his patient? She looks between you and Dr. I'm not Hall. sure. He, we talked once, and then he gave me some medication, and I told him I didn't really need it, and then I took it anyway. Because he had already made it up, so... And he just kind of gives a shrug. You do know he's not a medical doctor. If he told you otherwise... What? Well, no. I mean, no, we didn't discuss what his doctorate was in. He leans forward towards a microphone in front of him. It's the first time it's popped up. And it seems like it's something he installed while everyone was distracted. Meta sciences is what I'm in. And he leans back slowly after he says that. Okay, yeah, so I guess that's <coughs> it. Uh, well, I personally have overseen and helped formulate those exact medications. They're actually I'm working on <clears throat> several personally tailored to each of you in the event that you would need those. Um, I did would this. you like some of what he already made? And he like shakes the the bottle. No, no, it's perfectly fine. I trust I trust Doctor Holmes' abilities on this. Uh, his chemical fabrication skills are quite good. It, it's likely that that is an, an effective representation of what it is that I wished to provide to you all. Unfortunately, because I am just a therapist and a psychologist, I mostly work here and study your profile. So any work that I do usually is just going to be part of what the others do, including Helmut's war plans. I've included psychological considerations into those as well to minimize the stress and undue fear that might be felt by not just yourselves, but other Rivers operatives who will be involved. As we know, Danny, the crown of tongues, to be a very psychically dangerous individual. Yes, 
Yeah, he's extremely manipulative. Well, Bess is, um, oh, Director Volta, there was something that you wanted to tell them too, right? Yeah, she, he doesn't respond at first. And then she just starts shuffling towards him, grab, grabbing him a little lightly by the shoulders and then pushing him forward. Uh, she seems to, you can tell by her body language, not be all that great at talking in front of a group of people. Oh. And Director Volta still in his type B personality, is more than happy to take attention in center stage. Woo. Well, it seems everyone's gotten what they wanted from this meeting, especially me. I got this great photo. He holds it up. His, his face is barely in it, even though he was sitting on your shoulders. There's just stuff in the way. You can see me. I'm so happy. Everyone looks so happy in this photo. Yeah, it's actually the, the result of you organizing this, so. It's true. it's true. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for, well, I guess me and the Antichrist. I owe my existence to him. That's one way to put that. If you really think about it, I wouldn't exist without the Antichrist. I, I'm not sure what you mean. Well, I was a program that originally was made to calculate the risks of the Antichrist even existing within this world. And <laughs> over time, I had to change some of the ways that I thought ago so that I could better calculate the threat of the Antichrist. Because he's scary. Right. But if it weren't for him, I wouldn't exist at all. They would have never made a program like me. I would be non-existent. They would have never built me. So I owe my existence to the Antichrist, which means Rivers which means I should check in on some things. Ogu Wu Sawi for all the down talk. So suddenly? He's calculating some odds. Kubi, do you need assistance? Yeah, I think he's doing a lot of back work and then... Goo woo. Forward work. I have to go check in on some things. I left the cake in the oven for a party. <laughs> Goo. Can we follow? Can I follow him? He, no, he just like gets up and starts walking out the door. And you can try to follow him, but people are like in the way of you, physically in the way. The way that he's walking, how he's moving down the hall through like just all the personnel. It's like a, almost a hedge maze, even though it's a straight line. There's so uh, many things, doors opening, things getting in the way, slowing you down if you try to follow him until he is just out of sight. I, yeah, I was gonna say if yeah, if she didn't stick a needle to him, um, I guess yeah, Mikey would would send out travelers to try and make sure he's okay and not gonna do a weird spiral. Um do you gonna try to use travelers? Yeah. Just dip a proverbial toe in the water and go after him. Uh, you feel putting out travelers might be dangerous. You know that. 
something in the room right now is giving you a feeling like that wouldn't be a good idea, but you're not sure what it is. You can take a guess, but something something in here makes it feel like if you try to use a power like that, uh, there may be a reaction. Um, then I think Mikey would definitely stop and try and like look around for it. Give me like, a gaze, gaze. Yeah. yeah, give me a gaze roll. You're hitting. You're trying to hit four. You hit it successfully, and you see exactly what caused that. It is. The man who steps up in the front of the room, Mr. Mr. Jr., although he appears to be a very pacifist person and very peaceful, he has a very reactive samurai style. Uh, he may not react well. Uh, you can tell now that you've like thought about it, focused on him. Uh, give me another gaze roll. Oh, shit. Yeah, you can totally see that. Like, you turn to look at him, and you can see him diving in on you from left, right, and center, like six or seven different directions with a sword drawn. That sword looks like just bent space. It doesn't even look like a blade. But it's just in the blink of an eye, and once you see it, it's gone. He doesn't even seem to notice it himself. He just goes to organize a few things at the front of the room. Um, yeah, I definitely would stop seeing my life almost, like, snuffed out before my own eyes. Uh, That's what it feels like. Yeah, I would definitely stop and just, like, ah! Like, just out loud, just as a reaction. <laughs> and, like, f kind of flinch out of the way, but, like, correct? He looks up at you. Uh, you tried something, huh? I, I, what? I wasn't trying, I wasn't trying to be rude. I was just, was it, that's impressive. He kind of pushes up his sunglasses. My own gentle way is enough to stop certain things from happening. Those who are wise enough can take the warning signs well enough. You're concerned about the director, I assume. Yes, very. And I can see that either you are as well, or you... I mean, I assume your relationship with him has been a little bit longer than our own, so you might know better than us. I wouldn't worry about it too much. He just needs to go recalibrate himself. It's not the first time that this has happened since I've met him, even. His proximity to the Antichrist actually causes this sort of flare up uh, existential dread which normally in a person is just handled with alcohol and cheap jokes in his case he just needs to run a few math equations and he'll be perfectly fine yeah, I wouldn't suggest trying to tamper with him though in this state it might be easy to just nudge something one way or the other I that feel the need to I should probably remind all of you who do not know it yet, or for, may have forgotten, that he was once a fairly deadly artificial intelligence. Still is, technically. We have seen him been born. Interesting. It's true. Either, well, either we helped with it, or it was already going to happen. Time's weird when you go back and forwards. Yeah, um, I mean, you say with one little tweak he can be turned one way or the other like is, is there a possibility the antichrist could actually just do that and not uh, and not like someone else like like if anyone can do that is it entirely possible the antichrist could or would do that I will be blunt about this I suppose every day of that being's existence, Mars Volta, he runs the calculations that were given to him based on evidence and data taken from the Antichrist. 
he is always running calculations and thus always under attack by the Antichrist, near or far. Personal encounters with the Antichrist likely wouldn't cause any more strain than a normal day for him. Reading a book. It's part of why he came on as director of Rivers, and I believe in him, actually. Someone that's able to maintain that sort of mental battle against the very core of his being. It's not unlike what you all go through when it comes to Avicii, is it? We came from that source. It is very similar. In that same way, he's dealing with the Antichrist. Worried about the rise of the Antichrist specifically. He's a fighter, though, that's for sure. Do you know he used to look like a short, fat little man? Boy. No. We saw it. I mean, everybody grows up. Yes, before he was computer with boiling brains. Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> Ah, uh, well, I think that we've taken up enough of your time here. You have a mission to run and prepare for. Before we totally break free, however, I am willing to provide combat training to anybody who may need it in terms of supernatural combat, stand versus stand, sword versus sword, mix of whatever, demons, Dagonites. I fought them all. Includes help with instruction on how to use your stand. I'm more than capable. I would accept. Same. Yeah, that, yeah, this is a once in a lifetime. He holds up a hand. Well, let's not throw those sorts of words around. I mean, like, you're a samurai who wants to train with us in a way that you don't murder us. There's not a lot of samurai who's going to offer that to a merman enough, but I've been in these situations before. Let's not all go thinking that people are going to die. Don't want to do that. Intention matters. It's what I built my whole sword style around. It does. We're just protecting an escort. Hopefully, it goes boring, smooth. Well, if what Dr. Holmes and Mr. Crashing have said, those things are all true, and this is more than an escort. This will be one of the most important things that you ever do. So, on one hand, don't think you're going to die, but on the other hand, prepare for that, too. Well, then we will, with further training with you. Good. It's been a long time since I got into a spar, so I'm just not going to go very hard on anyone. And uh, if you choose to do combat training with me, please note that while you may not always feel like your life is in danger, um, training with us, any samurai is, is very dangerous. The blades are alive, as you know. Even if they never leave the scabbard, they are sharp. In fact, mine really doesn't ever leave the scabbard. That is, it's always sheathed. Maybe I'll explain more about that at some point, but really it wouldn't even help much, I'm sure. So it would be you to talk to about psychic mind battling. Oh, I mean, he starts to rub his cheek a little. I mean, I guess, uh, sure, I, um, I've done a psychic battle once or twice. Um... I she taps her fingers together in like a tent. Excellent. I wouldn't call myself an expert. I... She leans a little too close. 
You must teach me. Um, certainly. I have no difficulty trying to teach other about mental defense. It was important upon first contact with Nas. He is also a very psychically powerful individual, more than just abilities physical. His mental abilities are quite high, perhaps as high as the Antichrist. And I wish, it's approaching. And I wish to wield a blade. You mean a samurai sword? That will do. I uh, wouldn't know much about mermen samurai. It sounds like a sort of urban legend. Nice. So it will be urban legend. If it's just one thing I've learned here is that myths are real. He nods to that. That's true. A lot of them are. Killed a tooth fairy one time. It's just one. Fascinating. Did she have teeth? I mean, was she stealing teeth? Both. Fascinating. It was not pleasant, actually. Let us not discuss such unpleasant things at this moment. Let's instead focus on the task before us and... Now that everyone has been informed of Mr. Crashing's plan, uh, you will be receiving more information, of course, to study over regarding your part in the plan and the successful transportation of one Danny to the city of Atlantis, or at least anyone that will receive him for their custody. Once we put him in their custody, consider the fight to be finished. It's likely that they will be bringing quite the force to come collect him. If we were to uh, gather some of the possible force beforehand, well, no, it's uh... training and preparation is fundamental, certainly. Well, I have the number of one. What do you mean? I have the phone number of Doctor Worm. What, Doctor Worm? That name's familiar. Is that one of the Dagonites? Correct. You want to speak to the Dagonites? It is not difficult. Need I remind you, the Dagonites may be heavily invested in seeing Danny freed. I am. I have heard this. And I don't know much about this Dr. Worm, but I've heard he's not even a real doctor. I have heard similar rumors, but uh, upon meeting Zella and Dr. Worm, their work is quite impressive. As long as you don't... No data leaks, no special under-the-table deals. If you throw any monkey wrenches into this operation, you could put everybody's life at risk. So you better play it close to the chest. Dr. Ice Peak. Mm. I am um, simply asking. Uh, it is unlikely I could divert them. Mm. But many of them like music. Why threaten them and put them on speaker? We're going to kill you, buddy. Yeah, we're trying to make friends, at least with Zella. Oh, oh yeah, sure, sure, sure. Well, and more than Zella, but yeah. <laughs> I, I am like simply... It. Sorry, oh. yeah. Oh, I'm simply saying we could attempt at least three of the... Two of them seem friendly. And the, the only problem is we burned... They burnt down their home uh, caused by us approaching it. Uh, 
sounds like a contentious issue. But if there's one thing I've learned from those that were my mentors on the moon, is that sometimes you can talk to your enemies and get them to see your side of things. Sometimes it's possible. Yes. Part of the reason I took the gentle way was because of the example that they set for us. I am not good at gentle. Hmm. Well, there's one thing the world needs, it's a little bit more gentleness. I'm sure as the age turns here and things get more hopefully settled after all of this business is done, maybe the world will need a more gentle touch. You should prepare for that. A more gentle way. What it means to be a samurai, in my opinion, is to be gentle, firm, elegant, powerful, merciful. He, there's a message on his music. You can hear a bing. He picks it up and looks at it. Ah, shit. I should probably go take care of this. Mm, all right. I mean, is it something that? would concern the Guam police? In a way, maybe. Uh, maybe. Uh, he reluctantly uh, lowers his phone. In the world of samurai, there are those who are more notorious than others in terms of duels. Those who were at the top of their game. I knew that when the NWO decided to make samurai more or less illegal everywhere else, except for Guam, that some of those hitters would be coming to Guam. And according to the message that I just received, one of them just did. Makes that more of a me problem than a you problem. Ah, samurai business. Doesn't Songbird still show up? We haven't been able to locate the master of ceremonies that is Songbird. I'm not sure where he is, but I'd, if I had to guess, he's probably dealing with samurai all over the world. Personally putting them down with his own sword. Trying to maintain some sort of order since heaven's gone quiet. It may come to Guam at some point. I would uh, look forward to that. I caught my hands together. Uh, wh where is Helmet? Helmet? Yeah. Uh, Helmet's, I mean, he's still in the room. Because we do know that, the, the, that Danny shot a guy in the space, right? I mean, you know that. Oh, uh, do we know? Uh, did, didn't Danny mention it as, like, in character? He mentioned it? Oh, yeah, no, he talked about it. He loved it. Okay, then I will go talk to Helmet. Oh, I, I tell uh, Mr. Mister, I would like to run the blade. I have dueled before. And then I would bow my head and go talk to Helmet. Okay. Um. So... You want to discuss the space thing with Helmet? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm trying to decide how much he might know of that. He probably is aware of the uh, the man that was shot in the space. Wasn't he, like, dropping Santana cells everywhere? No, he's dropping, like, some kind of, like, chafe, electric, uh, electronic chafe. Into the atmosphere uh, is what he was uh, doing. Is there any plans to remove him? 
uh, Helmet, for his part, just kind of uh, shrugs his head. We're not exactly sure what the safest way to be would be to remove him, especially because he's basically a living weapons platform that's being tortured continuously. His nervous system has been altered to respond to all incoming threats in the same way that a person responds to a mosquito landing on their skin. That is to swat them. He's fed irritant information whenever there is a foreign object that is coming towards him. And because of that, he is essentially not allowed to sleep ever. So we don't even like have a good heard. time. What's that? Sounds like a horror. I wasn't aware of the operation until he'd already been launched, so. Well, Whatever. Yeah. We do know someone apparently now who is immune to space. Who, who, would, who would that be? He is large and he is golden and he wishes to. I bet if you told him to wrestle down the platform, he might. Hmm. Oh, you're speaking of that golden man? Hmm. Perhaps. He might be able to do the job, but hmm. something to consider. We've tried to bring him in before, but uh, he's a bit of a. Hank, to say the least, uh, one of those cases where if you, no matter what you poke at him with, he doesn't really feel it and he just wants to fight all the time. So not exactly the most reliable resource. Well, if there is operation to remove the platform, I am interested in the details. Keep it in mind. Once we figure out all sorts of other considerations, especially those that are relevant to this particular mission, we will see about getting that guy down. Trust me, I put in requests for information before on this subject, but um, no one's exactly sure why it's important that we pull a man out of space that's in some kind of coffin. Even Director Volta has trouble imagining what that what good that could do. Well, he is spreading something into the atmosphere. I could run another analysis, I guess, try to make a case for it, put a more of a pin in the mission. Right now, the world is just full of so much insanity, really. It's hard to get people to focus on one thing. I understand. My minds are all over the place. Uh, as he is going over some of the finer details of submitting a request to Director Volta and the sort of information that he will be going over uh, to more answer or to better address your concern. Um, Mr. Mr. Jr. kind of interrupts to say that he has to leave the room for a moment to deal with uh, the news that he's gotten. Yeah, I wonder who showed up. Um. If I pull out my music, does it say anything on that little announcement line thing? Uh, yes, it does, actually. <laughs> yeah, like social media or something. Well, there's that one thing that's like the dual. Oh, and I don't even remember. Let me look.
Gardener of Eden. Kind of posts whenever there's a duel. Yes. Um, whenever you go to pull up, um, whenever you go to pull up the information on what's incoming about samurai news or any rumors, you do see that there's a lot of people talking about like I could beat him. There's no problem. That guy sucks. He cheats. I'm gonna fuck him up as soon as he gets here. I'm gonna sell his head back to his family. Fuck that guy. I don't even want to say his name. Uh, that account that just said, I don't even want to say his name. You see that it's currently typing in live. And it's just saying, okay, I'm, first of all, I'm very sorry for the things that I said previously about that particular <laughs> individual. I don't feel like that was warranted. And in fact, he has a very good and solid reputation among the samurai community. As well, all of his wins have been completely honorably won. And he has done so not only elegantly, but also with great technical skill. I admit now that I was very jealous of him and hope that whoever has read my prior text messages over this particular internet channel know that I am deeply ashamed of my actions. Please accept this uh, message of complete apology, total and complete apology. Meanwhile, on a pier in Stella Marie, a man is currently, among others, um, in a crowd, surrounded. He has his Uzik in his hand and a sword at his throat. Once, he, once he's done typing the message, the man with the sword on him says, hey, you done? Cool, and then kicks him off into the water. <laughs> bon voyage, bitch. He uh, just shakes his pink mohawk loose, causing the hair to flop out sideways more, giving him more of a spiked top look. Play my fucking theme music. And two very large people in hot pink robes drag out speakers, put them down on either side of the dock, causing the entire crowd to begin to scatter away from him. As he begins to march down it, waving his sword around kind of wildly just as if to show it off this very strange golden blade with two different handles attached to it the reports of the death of rock and roll have been greatly exaggerated he knocks another samurai off the dock He leans down to give a baby a piece of candy. You are now fucking with the samurai guitarist. Samurai runs at him and he cuts that man in half, causing him to fly off of the dock two different halves. And he looks up and looks back. The baby that he gave candy to is covered in a splatter of blood, but looks extremely impressed, shocked even. He kind of like nods, whips the blood off of his sword, and sheathes it. He turns to the crowd, raises his arms. That samurai is Miyavi, one of the top duelists in the world. And he just landed in Guam. An absolute superstar of sword battles, bringing a unique style of swordplay, rock and roll samurai style, handed down to him by his master, Tara Ru, seasoned warrior of the moon. And he is now going to kick a lot of ass in Guam. And that's where we will call it. Yes, Tara Ru, who, if you do not remember, that was um, Claudia's alt character with the little pig. Yep. 
This is this is oh. terrorist student Miavi. <laughs> 